Is that taken? Yeah, don't worry. I'm just looking for some. I can see a place there.
Dear INCO committee members, uh, dear members of uh, the European Parliament, uh, uh, dear journalists, I would like to welcome uh, <coughs> Ms. Frances Hogan here in the European Parliament. Thank you uh, for participating in uh, this hearing. In this hearing, uh, the INCO committee and associated committees uh, will listen to the testimony of uh, Mrs. Uh, Frances Haugen, an expert uh, in algorithmic product management and former employee of uh, Facebook. Uh, Ms. Haugen uh, disclosed uh, thousands of internal documents uh, that uh, she collected while working for uh, Facebook. Uh, the purpose of the hearing is to enable uh, IMCO and associated committees to better understand uh, the challenges posed by social media algorithms uh, uh, to online user safety, especially in the context of the uh, Digital Services Act, uh, which intends uh, to regulate uh, the provision of uh, inter intermediary services and, in particular, uh, 
to achieve a safe and trusted online environment for users. Firstly, before uh, the hearing, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, the representatives uh, of the other committees uh, 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 to take the floor for opening remarks, uh, two minutes uh, per committee. And uh, the first speaker in my list uh, is uh, Adrian uh, Vasquez uh, Lazara, Lazara. Uh, chair of uh, jury committee please gracias presidente quiero comenzar mi intervención agradeciendo a la señora Haugen por estar hoy aquí y por el valor que ha demostrado por denunciar públicamente primero en Estados Unidos y ahora aquí en el Parlamento Europeo las malas prácticas de uno de los mayores gigantes tecnológicos del planeta a nadie se le escapa que las grandes tecnológicas acumulan hoy un poder muy superior al de la mayoría de las empresas. Y en algunos casos... ¿You don't have the interpretation? One, one moment. Please. Yes, we wait. No worry. But uh, we have the technical questions. Uh, it's not uh, uh, only about... Uh, Ms. Hogan, but uh, other people say that uh, uh, there is no translation. First row is blocked. Why? Sorry, we, we've tried to fix uh, this problem and, and I would like to ask you to, to start from the very beginning again. Thank you. So, oh. Yeah, uh, sorry for this, but now it seems we can, can, can start really. So, uh, Mr. Lazara, the floor is yours, please. Gracias, Presidente. Me he venido aquí al final de la sala. Como decía, empezaba mi intervención dando las gracias a la señora Hogan por estar hoy aquí y por el valor de haber demostrado públicamente, primero en Estados Unidos y luego en la Unión Europea, eh, y haber denunciado las malas prácticas de uno de los mayores gigantes tecnológicos que hay hoy en el planeta. A nadie se le escapa que las grandes tecnológicas acumulan hoy un poder muy superior a la mayoría de las empresas y, en algunos casos, superior a muchos estados. Por ello, denuncias como la que usted realiza implican un altísimo riesgo profesional e incluso personal. 
Participo en esa comparecencia, señora Hogan, en calidad de presidente del Comité de Asuntos Jurídicos del Parlamento Europeo. Este comité tiene entre sus competencias legislativas la regulación de las cuestiones éticas relacionadas con las nuevas tecnologías. Por ello, su testimonio no podría resultar más relevante para nuestro trabajo presente y futuro en aspectos como, por ejemplo, el de la inteligencia artificial. Su testimonio ha puesto de manifiesto que Facebook podría estar priorizando su beneficio como compañía sobre el bienestar de sus usuarios, incluso sobre la convivencia democrática de muchos países, especialmente al permitir que su algoritmo amplifique mensajes de odio, desinformación, noticias falsas o contenido profundamente dañino, dañino para adolescentes y niños. Algo que es probable, por desgracia, no sea exclusivo de esta empresa. Me preocupa pensar que es posible que la única diferencia entre las prácticas de otras grandes tecnológicas y las de Facebook sea que este último ha sido descubierto gracias al escándalo de Cambridge Analytica o a testimonios valientes como el suyo. Quisiera aprovechar, por tanto, esta intervención para preguntarla si considera que existe un riesgo real de que abusos y malas prácticas como los que hoy debatimos sean comunes a otras plataformas distintas a Facebook o incluso de que sean la norma general en las redes sociales. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, uh, Juan Fernando López uh, Arilar to take the floor. Please, Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Mrs. Huygen. I'm talking to you in my capacity as Chair of the Committee of Legal Justice and Home Affairs of the European Parliament, which has been engaged for a number of years by now in making laws on fundamental rights issues related files and the protection of personal data most particularly. Privacy of users of platforms such as Facebook have therefore been a relevant element of discussion throughout the years in the Libre Committee, which I have the honor to chair. Of course, we we'll welcome you here, your testimony in this hearing on the negative impact on users of high-tech company products and business models, how EU digital rules can address these issues. Let me reassure you that uh, we are very much engaged in the discussions around the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, providing an opinion on these matters. But the revelations that you have come up with are most troubling regarding the direct impact on users but also a, not a potential, an actual attack on their fundamental rights. But this is not the first time we see ourselves facing this kind of situation. Three years ago, we put in place a number of hearings on the abuses discovered regarding Cambridge Analytica proceedings and revelations. In its resolution at the time, this European Parliament stated that data analysis and algorithms have an increasing impact, I'm quoting, on the information made accessible to citizens and that such techniques, if misused, and they are actually misused, I add, may endanger fundamental rights to information as well as media freedom and pluralism. So your revelations are confirming that we have reached some kind of a high point, a peak where the fundamental rights of users are at stake. We see the impact of these algorithms exploiting mental health of teenagers, micro-targeting and impinging on people fundamental rights, but not only for commercial purposes, but also for political, political targeting, political purposes. So as it appears by now that self-regulation by the companies themselves is failing, utterly failing, the simple question would be, What is your assessment on the revelation on these uh, 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 proceedings by, by Facebook and the kind of regulation safeguards that you would like to see fit for the future, particularly at the disposal of the European Parliament field of action? And would you think that the current proposal at EU level is something of relevance? According to your assessment, As far as you know, are they sufficient, the packets at site, or is there anything else 
that could and should be done. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, Raphael Glucksmann to take the floor, please. Merci, merci, uh, cher collègue. Tout d'abord, je tiens à remercier la Commission INCO d'avoir associé notre Commission 1G à cette audition cruciale. Nous, nous sommes ravis, Madame Hogan, de vous accueillir. Notre Commission travaille depuis un an sur les ingérences étrangères et les campagnes de désinformation. Et il apparaît clairement que les plateformes comme Facebook sont devenues des terrains de jeu pour des puissances hostiles cherchant à déstabiliser nos démocraties. De Moscou à Pékin, les régimes autoritaires censurent les réseaux chez eux, mais les utilisent chez nous pour ébranler nos institutions, avec, il semble, le consentement tacite des dirigeants de ces dites plateformes. De la boîte noire des algorithmes aux publicités en ligne qui sont au cœur du modèle économique de ces plateformes, c'est le modèle même de ces espaces publics qui sont aussi des propriétés privées qui posent problème à nos démocraties. Nous avons aujourd'hui beaucoup de questions à vous poser. Pouvez-vous nous indiquer comment l'algorithme de Facebook affecte et façonne la société et comment les législateurs peuvent contrer ces pratiques Pensez-vous que les législations actuellement proposées par la Commission, telles que le Code de pratique sur la désinformation, peuvent contribuer à mieux réguler ces plateformes Pouvez-vous nous donner plus de détails sur la façon dont l'algorithme de Facebook est utilisé pour des ingérences étrangères et des campagnes de désinformation Que s'est-il dit Que s'est-il fait au sein de Facebook lorsque les campagnes de 2016 aux états unis ou du Brexit ont montré à quel point les plateformes pouvaient déstabiliser nos démocraties. Pour cela, il est urgent que les plateformes assument leurs responsabilités. Mais afin qu'elles assument leurs responsabilités, il est urgent, chers collègues, que nous assumions les nôtres. Il n'est pas d'endroit qui puisse échapper à la loi et il est de notre ressort de législateur de faire en sorte que nos démocraties ne soient pas déstabilisées par ces mastodontes. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Uh, next, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dragos Tutaras to take the floor, representing AIDA committee. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for associating AIDA also to the, to the hearing tonight. Congratulations, Mrs. Hogan, for the courage to stand up for values that are so important to, to us as consumers, as individuals. I represent the special committee of this House on Artificial Intelligence, and we spent, in fact, the last year looking into the impact of AI and the underlying algorithms powering AI with the paramount will of this House to ensure that AI develops on the basis of rules that protect human rights and interests. Your revelations are confirming many of the concerns, dare I say fears, that for many of us in this House had been uh, related to the practices by big platforms, particularly social media platforms. DSA is already an ambitious starting point introducing an obligation for risk assessments on how platforms work. I think it is a good tool to address systemic risk built into the algorithm, algorithms, but in its current logic, it only concerns illegal content. So, how do you think we could regulate harmful content not yet passing the threshold of illegality? And presuming we would have the rules, or that platforms such as Facebook would have the will to intervene by their own volition, Do you think, in your expert knowledge, that algorithms can be reverse engineered once they have grown into a given direction? Thank you. Thank you, Travos. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all the committee uh, chairs for your opening remarks. The hearing will be organized as follows. Uh, first, uh, Ms. Hogan uh, will give a uh, 15 minute uh, presentation, then uh, uh, there will be a Q&A uh, session. There will be two rounds of uh, questions and answers, two minute question uh, by members and two minute answer by Ms. Uh, Hogan. And uh, now I would like to ask Ms. Hogan to take the floor for presentation. Thank you, uh, Chair Kazavi. Kazav, please forgive my pronunciation on things. Um, Kavazani, Honorable member, Members of the European Parliament, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and for your interest in confronting some of the most urgent threats to the citizens of the European Union. My name is Frances Haugen. I used to work at Facebook 
and joined the company because I believe Facebook has the potential to bring out the best in us. But I am here today because I believe that Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, weaken our democracy, and much more. The company's leadership knows ways to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but they won't make the necessary changes because they have put their immense profits before people. The consequences are severe. The Facebook platform today damages the health and safety of our communities and threatens the integrity of our democracies. Rising to meet these challenges won't be easy, but democracies must do what they have always done when the actions of commerce conflict with the interests of the people and society as a whole. Democracies must step in and make new laws. I am grateful that the European Union is taking this very seriously. The Digital Services Act that is now before this parliament has the potential to be a global gold standard. It can inspire other countries, including my own, to pursue new rules that would safeguard our democracies. But the law has to be strong and its enforcement firm. Otherwise, we will lose this once in a generation opportunity to align the future of technology and democracy. My analysis and explanation of the documents in my disclosure is grounded in more than the time I spent at Facebook. I have worked as a product manager at large tech companies since 2006, including Google, Pinterest, Yelp, and Facebook. My job has largely focused on algorithmic products like Google Plus Search and recommendation systems like the one that powers the Facebook newsfeed. Working at four major tech companies that operate different types of social networks, I have been able to compare and contrast how each company approaches and deals with different challenges. The choices being made by Facebook's leadership are a huge problem for children, for public safety, and for democracy. That's why I came forward. And let's be clear, it doesn't have to be this way. We are here today because of deliberate choices Facebook has made. I joined Facebook in 2019 because someone close to me was radicalized online. I felt compelled to take an active role in, role in creating a better, less toxic Facebook. During my time at Facebook, first working as the lead product manager for civic misinformation and later on counterespionage, I saw that Facebook repeatedly encountered conflicts between its own profits and our safety. Facebook consistently resolved these conflicts in favor of its own profits. The result has been a system that amplifies division, extremism, and polarization. It undermines societies around the world. In some cases, this dangerous online talk has led to actual violence that harms and even kills people. In other cases, their profit-optimizing machine is generating self-harm and self-hate, especially for vulnerable groups like teenage girls. These problems have been confirmed repeatedly by Facebook's own internal research. This is not simply a matter of some social media users being angry or unstable. Facebook became, uh, Facebook became a $1 trillion company by, by paying for its profits with our safety, including the safety of our children. And that is unacceptable. I believe what I did was right and necessary for the common good. But I know Facebook has infinite resources, which it could use to destroy me. I came forward because I recognized a frightening truth. Almost no one outside of Facebook knows what happens inside of Facebook. The company's leadership keeps vital information from the public, the US government, its shareholders, and governments around the world. The documents I have provided prove that Facebook has repeatedly misled us about what its own research reveals about the safety of children, its role in spreading hateful and polarizing messages, and so much more. The right answer to this emergency is new rules and standards. The EU's Digital Services Act has a huge potential it does not try to delete this problem with content regulations. It takes a content-neutral approach uh, to address the systemic risks 
and harms of the overall business model, and I strongly support this approach. There's much to say about this legislation, but I want to highlight three issues that are critically important based on my experiences. First, risk assessments and access to privacy-aware data streams. Second, comprehensive rules and standards for the business model. Third, the danger of loopholes and exemptions. I'll address these three in turn. At the core of the problems we face right now is that no one can understand Facebook's destructive choices better than Facebook because only Facebook gets to look under the hood. Facebook cannot remain the judge, jury, prosecutor, and witness. So a critical starting point for effective regulation is transparency. Full access to data for research not directed by Facebook. We need more experts studying these problems, and they must have all the data they need to do it. It is critical to get this right, and the devil will be in the details. For example, if you write a broad exemption for transparency for anything classified as a trade secret, the companies will say everything is a trade secret. Facebook would still operate in the dark, continuing to make choices that go against the common good. So I believe researchers should respect trade secrets once they have received proprietary data. But trade secrets can and should not be an excuse for companies to refuse access to data. Access to data is the starting point. It's what permits researchers and regulators to assess risks and harms of the whole system of profiling, targeting, and engagement-based ranking. The evidence in my disclosures to the SAC make clear that engagement-based ranking systems are one of the root causes for some of the greatest systemic risks that social media poses to our societies. This is a system-level problem. This is why new rules must not be limited to illegal content, but must also include the recommendation of content that violates a platform's terms and conditions. Using content-neutral tools the DSA should force platforms to take responsibility for the risks beyond the spread of illegal content, such as manipulation of elections, the explosive spread of disinformation, or the harms of teenage mental health. The heart of this legislation lies in the strength of Articles 26 and 27. This brings me to my third point. I have read with great interest their efforts to exempt news media content from the rules of the DSA. But if you're going to make content neutral rules, then they must really be neutral. Nothing is singled out and nothing is exempted. Let me be very clear. Every modern disinformation campaign will exploit news media channels on digital platforms by gaming the system. If the DSA makes it illegal for platforms to address these issues, we risk undermining the effectiveness of the law. Indeed, we may be worse off than today's situation. If you get the DSA right for your linguistically and eth ethnically diverse 450 million EU citizens, you can create a game changer for the world. You can force platforms to price in societal risk to their business operations so the decisions about what products to build and how to build them is not purely based on profit maximization. You can establish systemic rules and standards that address risks while protecting free speech. And you can show the world how transparency, oversight, and enforcement should work. Let's not forget, we have stood at these crossroads before. When tobacco companies claimed that filtered cigarettes were safer for consumers, it was possible for scientists to independently invalidate that this marketing message, because it was just a marketing message, and confirmed that, in fact, they still posed a serious threat to human health. They were actually, in fact, more toxic than unfiltered cigarettes. But today, we can't make this kind of independent assessment of Facebook. We have to just trust Facebook says what tr Facebook says is true, and they have repeatedly proved they do not deserve our blind faith. Trust is earned. It's not just given. Facebook's regulators can see some of, these pro can see some of the problems but they are kept blind to what is causing them and thus can't craft specific solutions. They can't even access the company's own data on product safety, much less conduct an independent audit. How is the public supposed to assess if Facebook is resolving conflicts of interest in a way that is aligned with the public good 
if it has no visibility and no context into how Facebook really operates. This must change. Dear members of, dear members of Parliament, there is a lot at stake here. You have a once in a generation opportunity to create new rules for our online world. A safer, more enjoyable social media is possible. If there are only two things that everyone takes away from these disclosures, it should be, first, Facebook chooses profit over safety every day. And without bold action from lawmakers, this will continue. The second is that Facebook has exploited its ability to hide the actual behavior of the platform to allow our safety decay to an unacceptable level. If Facebook is allowed to continue to operate in darkness, we will only see escalating tragedies as a result. I came forward at great personal risk because I believe we still have time to act, but we must act now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haugen, uh, for your uh, presentation. And now we can start with the Q&A session. First, I would like to ask Andres Schwab from ETP Group to take uh, the floor. Please, Andres. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Ich werde es auf Deutsch machen. Deswegen möchte ich Frau Hogan zunächst begrüßen und darum bitten, dass sie die Kopfhörer aufsetzt. Sie haben ja, äh, Frau Hogan, äh, jetzt äh, sehr, sehr interessant auch über berichtet, darüber berichtet, wie Sie in anderen Firmen nicht nur bei Facebook mit algorithmischen äh, Prozessen betraut waren und welche Mechanismen dabei eine Rolle spielen. Und ich würde gerne jetzt mit meiner Frage zunächst mal auf die Risiken für die Demokratie eingehen, weil Sie wissen ja, dass die europäische Demokratie vielfältig und sehr lebhaft ist und wir alles erdenkliche Unternehmen Sie ähm, zu sichern. Dafür gab es auch schon einige Fragen. Deswegen würde ich gerne von Ihnen ein bisschen näher wissen, wie Sie vor, zur Vorbereitung der amerikanischen Wahl die ähm, Algorithmen äh, bei Facebook so runterreguliert haben, dass gewissermaßen die negativen Einflüsse, die Sie zuvor wahrgenommen haben, da können Sie vielleicht auch kurz was dazu sagen, diese negativen Einflüsse herunterreguliert haben. Denn um es kurz zu machen, es ist natürlich ein Eingriff in bestehende Prozesse, auch wenn wir als Abgeordnete nicht der Auffassung sind, dass die Demokratie über privatwirtschaftliche Terms and Condition geregelt werden kann, ist es trotzdem so, dass die Nutzer einen unterschiedlichen Eindruck bekommen haben vor dem Eingriff durch die Firma und nach dem Eingriff durch die Firma. Und mich würde einfach von Ihrer Seite aus sehr interessieren, welche Veränderungen stattgefunden haben und wie dadurch die Meinungsfreiheit, aber möglicherweise eben auch das Nutzerverhalten insgesamt und auch ähm, die wirtschaftlichen Interessen der Beteiligten äh, sich verändert haben. Darüber würde ich gerne etwas wissen und dann vielleicht auch aus Ihrer Sicht einen Kommentar, welche Auswirkungen damit ähm, für die Meinungsfreiheit und für die Demokratie insgesamt verbunden sind. Vielen Dank, dass Sie heute da sind. Thank you, Andreas. Ms. Haugen, please. Sorry, my apologies. I said that's a lot to address in two minutes, but I will do my best. With regard to the risk to democracies, um, one of the, so the inherent danger in engagement-based ranking, and Mark Zuckerberg has said this specifically, he has said in, tw in 2018 even, uh, engagement-based ranking is dangerous because people are drawn to engage with extreme content more than, le than more mainline content. When that happens, Effectively, we give a much, 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 much larger fraction of the public forum to the most extreme, the most polarizing, the most divisive content. This also happens in ads. Because ads that get more engagement are cheaper, running an angry, hateful, divisive political campaign will be five to ten times cheaper than running one that is about empathy and compassion. Democracies cannot exist if we can't see each other as human beings, if we can't have empathy and, and solidarity with each other. Um, and so I believe that um, having a system that amplifies uh, divisive content like that will erode our democracies. The second question is around um, what can we do with regard to regulating private economy um, and, uh, and, and, and in, in a way that is um, uh, 
I'm trying to hit, hit both freedom of expression, and we may not get there. Um, so I'm a strong proponent of what I call one, two, three risk assessments. So companies should assess themselves, but there should also be some party that can gather feedback from the community, because Facebook is very homogenous. It largely speaks English. It's largely isolated in California, at least those who are making most decisions. Um, and unless you go and survey civil society groups, you're not going to get a full picture. The, the three is Facebook should have to articulate how it will solve those harms, because it has gotten into a rut where every time something is exposed, all they do is say, we're so sorry, this is really hard, we're working on it. We need to change our relationship with these platforms where they have to actually articulate what the plan is for fixing them, and they should have to disclose aggregate privacy-sensitive uh, privacy data so that we can independently see are they actually making progress on those concerns. Um, I think that is probably the most flexible way of regulating a private company they, because it can happen and be dynamic over and over again. The concerns of today and the concerns of five years ago will be different concerns. And as long as we have that kind of f framework where the community's involvement is in place in addition to um, the needs of just the company, I think there's a way of covering more of those issues. Thank you. Now I would like to ask uh, Christel Schaldemos uh, to take the floor, please. Thank you so much, and uh, a great thanks to you, uh, Ms. Haugen, for being here today. Uh, I'm really happy that you took uh, our invitation and came. It's very timely for the work we do on, on the DSA. Uh, and I agree with you that this is a historic moment. We have a chance, we have a historic opportunity to do something for uh, regulating and maybe take back control to society from the big tech uh, uh, companies. Uh, thank you for your, uh, all your statements. Uh, I would like to discuss a little bit about how we modernize the liability uh, rules. Uh, you also said it in the Congress that, you know, in the United States you have Section 230 and uh, uh, giving uh, the tech companies uh, um, immunity from civil liability, and we have the same in the e-commerce. They are exempted from liability, the platforms. Uh, but uh, when you talk about one, two, three, you kind of uh, send a signal that you want uh, the platforms to become liable, accountable for their algorithms and how they work. So could you maybe uh, give us uh, your uh, suggestions on how we could make them liable or accountable at least? Uh, because I think this is, this is key. Of course, they should not be liable for what I put on Facebook, but how they use what I put on Facebook, I think that could be important for them to, to be. So that I would be happy to, to hear uh, about uh, that. Uh, uh, and I think that's the most important thing, so I will give you more time to answer instead of using all my time. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Please, Ms. Haugen. The question of how to incre increase the accountability of these platforms is a very important one. One of the things that I think is es essential is uh, my understanding is today there's no it, there's really no practical way to bring a class action lawsuit either in the United States or in Europe, partially because we don't have a way of seeing differential harms. When you think about mandatory data. There are ways to segment the population that are privacy sensitive. I worked on some of these, where you uh, produce a, a cohorts and you can report stats in an aggregated way on differential harms per population. So what we found in the case of COVID misinformation was that 4% of the population received 80% of all the COVID misinformation. This is not a novel problem. It is a problem that repeats itself with every harm type. So I think one thing is if you want to hold the platforms accountable for, say, some children being overexposed to self-harm content, there has to be a way for us to get information on those concent that concentration of harm. Um, because, like I said, every harm type has these kinds of problems because of how the algorithms push people towards homo homogeneity. I think the second question on liability is around um, responsibility. I'm a strong proponent that, uh, so one of the repeated things we hear from Facebook is that no one can, no person can be held accountable for any decision that happens on the platform, that committees of people decide everything. I think requiring that a name should be associated with every change would actually radically change the culture of Facebook. Because today, people hide behind that, that unified front, and it means that no one stands up for what's right because no one will ever have it traced back to them. 
I think the last question is around things like executive liability. Um, I am relatively agnostic on executive liability. I think it amplifies the effect of any law that you pass. So if you feel really confident in the law that you've passed, then uh, executive liability can be a good thing, um, or at least makes them take it a lot more seriously. Um, but at the same time, if the law is not good, it can cause counter effects and side effects. So I am, I'm not a lawmaker. I, I'm, it's probably beyond my scope to weigh in on that. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask Tita Sharansova to take the floor. Tita, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mrs. Haugen. Uh, you worked at a unit for civic integrity, as you mentioned, and you also said in one of your interviews that dissolving that unit was the sign that Facebook uh, was not interested in fighting disinformation. In the Digital Services Act, uh, which I understand you, you read uh, and you, you are aware of all the details, we have now different articles, both on risk assessment, mitigation of risks, independent audit, uh, enforcement mechanisms. So it would make actually mandatory that Facebook would have such a unit and action, will have to act against disinformation and harmful content, which is something, to my knowledge, which is not required and is not a proposal in the U.S. But at the same time, in our proposal, as it is drafted, it will be still Facebook itself that will choose the ways how to mitigate the risk. Do you think this is a good approach? Or do you think we should have perhaps national regulators to micromanagement ma manage such a massive, complex system? Thank you. Ms. Haugen, please. I feel fairly strongly that the role for regulators is to make sure that Facebook has to follow at least a certain amount of the rules of the road. So this is less so a thing of saying you must do X, Y, Z in terms of how to change your platform, but is more so, you know, if we have like a one, two, three approach, that they have to, you know, take an input from lots of community groups in a way that is not filtered by Facebook itself, or that they have to report on statistics that would allow us to see have they actually made progress on what they said was the solutions. Um, I'm a strong proponent also for, for criteria on what is a rigorous enough solution. Like, it has to be a, a good faith plan on how will you solve these things. I think it is. Uh, it will be difficult to have a regulator that mandates specific changes, partially because any time you draw a fence, companies figure out how to run around the fence. Um, and so having something dynamic like a risk assessment process is important. Um, but the secondary thing is I, I, I feel strongly that part of why regulators should be gathering that ha uh, forcing platforms to disclose that data or for forcing them to disclose their harms publicly is right now people never get a fair chance to assess if they want to use these products. Right? Facebook, because they have misled us over and over again, people's dignity is being violated because they are exposed to harms that they are told don't exist. Right? And that's not, that's not fair or just. Um, I, do, I also think that if you have auditors that are paid for by Facebook, you will run into problems with, um, they will, auditors will want to get hired again, and if they are paid by Facebook, they will likely not do as thorough a job as is necessary. Um, so having the ability for the public to see risk assessments is actually quite important for consumers to be able to inf uh, have informed choices. Thank you. Thank you. And next, uh, I would like to ask Alexandra Geza to take the floor, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mrs. Hogan, for being here today, for coming forward. I think I can speak on behalf of almost all my colleagues, saying that we're extremely grateful to you for that, at, and you're doing that at, at great personal risk, and we really appreciate. I have two questions. Um, you have stressed the importance of access to data for civil society. Do you think the current wording in the DSA, which under certain circumstances allows for access for vetted academic researchers only, is enough? Or do you think we should also give access to NGOs and investigative journalists, for example, under certain conditions? And you might want to outline those conditions and those processes. That's the first question. And my second question is, 
Um, you have been an advocate for strong regulation um, that is needed to make sure Facebook doesn't continue to harm society. But we all know that regulation needs to be enforced to be effective. What kind of enforcement do you think we need? Will national oversight in 27 member states be able? Will those agencies be able to recruit enough experts? Or do you think a European enforcement agency with a strong center of competence for systemic risks should be established? Would that be a way to make sure that the DSA really has teeth and that Europe could become a beacon for the world in digital regulation? Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Haugen, please. I think this question does a great job of highlighting the importance of having an ecosystem of, of both analysts and an ecosystem of people proposing solutions is so important. So the first question is around uh, giving data to vetted academic researchers and like whether or not that circle is broad enough. Um, just so people have context, in the case of Twitter, which is substantially more transparent than Facebook, there's something called a fire hose. And the fire hose contains one-tenth of all the tweets that appear on, on Twitter. There are easily 10 to 20,000 analysts around the world that analyze this public data. And because they have access to it, they find things like influence operations, information operations being run by foreign actors like Russia. A huge fraction of those operations that exist on Facebook were caught not on Facebook, they were caught on Twitter. And when people looked at those accounts, they found identical accounts on Facebook. If Facebook had to, like, I, I strongly encourage you to not just give data to academics because the population of incredibly competent people who are experts in the space exist outside of academia and they exist outside of government and they will continue to do so. We need to build that ecosystem of having of, of people building the muscle to understand Facebook if we want to be safe. Um, and they often are very novel, like they find different strategies that are, are not yet um, maybe um, have, have reached academia. The second question is around whether or not enforcement, and actually to add one thing on there, I, I would love to do commentary if I had data, right? I am not an academic. I probably won't get accepted. I, you know, I'm not going to be a professor, probably. Um, but you want to be able to have people like me who have the expertise from inside of companies to then illustrate patterns with public data. The last question is on um, member states. Um, so just to be super, super blunt here, the number of experts, formal experts in these things, so I think this is how the algorithms really work and the consequences of them. There are very, very few in the world because you can't get a master's degree in it, you can't get a PhD in it, you have to go work for one of these companies and be trained up internally. And I sincerely worry that if you uh, delegate this functionality to 27 member states, you will not be able to get critical mass in any one place. Um, like I think it, it's a, it'll be very, very difficult to get enough experts and distribute them that broadly. Um, there are definitely people who have worked in industry who really want to give back by contributing to public accountability. Um, and so having a home for them, I think, is important. Having a place where they can cross-pollinate to academia and other outlets. But having a home is going to be really important. Thank you. Next, uh, I would like to uh, ask Alexandra Bassa to take the floor. Grazie, Presidente. E gentile signora Hagen, la ringrazio davvero per questa opportunità di scambio. Nel suo intervento al congresso e nella sua intervista al programma 60 minuti ha sollevato molti punti interessanti. Le sue motivazioni sono molto nobili e condivido la sua preoccupazione per ciò che noi e i nostri figli vediamo ogni giorno su internet. Creare un ambiente sicuro deve essere un'assoluta priorità per noi legislatori e avrei alcune domande da porle. La prima riguarda la polarizzazione del confronto politico e il conseguente inasprimento delle interazioni tra gli utenti che richiedono di conseguenza un maggior intervento da parte della stessa Facebook. Essendo l'algoritmo di Facebook strutturato in modo da confermare le idee dell'utente, come si può, secondo lei, da un punto di vista tecnico, rimediare a questo cortocircuito voluto? Può bastare una maggiore consapevolezza sulla gestione dei propri dati da parte dell'utente 
oppure deve essere necessario un intervento sull'algoritmo per fare in modo che all'utente vengano presentate anche opinioni diverse dalla propria. E poi, dove va messo il punto di equilibrio per creare un ambiente sicuro per tutti, ma specialmente per i minori, e la tutela della libertà di espressione? Può un semplice algoritmo che lavora tramite parole chiave svolgere un compito così complesso? Avrei poi una curiosità in tema di minori. Che cosa ne pensa della legge proposta in Norvegia che impone di segnalare quando una fotografia è stata ritoccata con l'evidente scopo di tutelare gli adolescenti dall'immaginare come reali modelli che sono di fatto irraggiungibili. La ringrazio. Thank you. Ms. Haugen, please. Mm-hmm. Um, one of Facebook's most common refrains in response to me has been, uh, it makes no business interest to design a system that intentionally spreads misinformation or spreads polarizing content. And the reality is, uh, it's not a question that they were deliberate in designing these systems to do these things. It is a question that it was deliberate that they did not change them once they discovered that a side effect of their choices was to spread more misinformation or more division. There are many possible changes, many of them content neutral, to reduce the amount of misinformation, division, divisive content. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, You could require clicking on a link before you reshare it. That reduces misinformation substantially. You could make reshare chains shorter. You could say, you know, after you get beyond friends of friends, If you want to reshare it at that point, you need to copy and paste it, and and you can totally share whatever you want. Like, we're we're not oppressing you. We're not judging your ideas. We're just saying, make an intentional choice if you want to spread it further. That has the same impact as the entire third-party fact-checking system in terms of reducing misinformation, only it works for all languages in the world. Um, Or things like Facebook knows if they show you more content from your family and friends for free, you get less misinformation, less division, less polarization. So yes, Facebook knows lots of ways to change the system, but it it chooses not to because it will grow less. You'll consume less content. You'll consume less ads. They'll make less money. With regard to uh, having more representative views, Um, I think as long as there is engagement-based ranking, it is likely that the system will continue pulling people towards polarization. Facebook has run the same experiment over and over again where they have a brand new account, no friends, no interest, and they they follow just a few mainline interests. So maybe they're center-right or they're center-left. And the thing that happens every time, or it's things like healthy eating. And every time, if you just engage with the recommendations Facebook gives you, it keeps getting more and more extreme. You know, in the case of politics, it leads to content about killing your opposition or white genocide, you know, crazy ideas. Um, For that healthy eating one, it leads you to anorexia content. So there's a real thing of we need to um, be thinking about, it's not bad people or bad ideas. It's about a system that is biased towards spreading the most extreme ideas. That's the real problem. And then lastly, with regard to the Norwegian law, I'm not familiar with this, um, and I don't know what modified means. Um, And so, unfortunately, I can't comment on it. But I'm happy to later. Thank you. Uh, The next speaker is uh, Cosma Zlotowski. Cosma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will speak in Polish. (laughs) We know that we have a lot of platform internet szerzenie dezinformacji i promowanie treści budzących negatywne emocje i konflikty. Sam Facebook pod wpływem licznych oskarżeń zlecał audyty, które ujawniały wiele nieprawidłowości dotyczących także negatywnego wpływu na procesy wyborcze. Każdy z nas, kto ma konto na tym portalu lub na innych widzi, że powstają tam bańki informacyjne, że treści są coraz bardziej jednostronne, że korzystanie z mediów społecznościowych jest po prostu coraz bardziej nudne. Czy w Pani ocenie takie działanie Facebooka, promowanie agresji i fake newsów było celowe, czy to po prostu efekt uboczny braku wystarczającej kontroli konkretnych osób nad działaniem portalu? 
czy algorytmy decydujące o wyświetlaniu użytkownikom określonych treści, wywoływanie skrajnych emocji, czy relacji były zaprojektowane w taki sposób, aby promować treści kontrowersyjne, czy same ewoluowały na podstawie jakichś ogólnych wytycznych ich projektantów. Czy inne platformy i firmy technologiczne według Pani, wiedzia, według pani wiedzy działają w taki sam sposób, na ile to jest patologia całej branży technologicznej, a na ile problem jednego przedsiębiorstwa? To oczywiście bardzo ważne pytania w kontekście regulacji, nad którymi pracuje obecnie Parlament Europejski, zarówno jeśli chodzi o platformy internetowe, ale także o sztuczną inteligencję. Ale jest też inne pytanie, może nawet znacznie ważniejsze, czy krępując rozwój internetu, w tym przede wszystkim platform, nowymi regulacjami nie tworzymy zbyt wielu ograniczeń dla wolności słowa i nie limitujemy prawa do swobodnej debaty publicznej. Wychowałem się w kraju autorytarnym i każda próba ograniczenia wolności słowa budzi mój sceptycyzm. Internet miał być przecież przestrzenią wolności. Czy Pani zdaniem naprawdę jedyny wybór, jaki mamy, to wybór między ograniczeniami tej wolności przez monopole platform, a jej ograniczeniem przez organy władzy publicznej? I czy w końcu nie prowadzi to do czegoś, co można by nazwać demokracją emocji? Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you, Cosma. Ms. Haugen, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to bend more towards the bottom and go kind of upwards. Um, so I think this question of is Facebook different is a really important question. Um, Facebook is substantially less transparent than other large platforms, and I think that plays out in that they make less responsible decisions as a result. So I'll give you a concrete example. Google knows their results can be downloaded and that people analyze them. And as a result, uh, they, they take action. They remove toxic content um, because they know that people are watching. Um, they also staff engineers who work on search to explain search to people. Twitter knows that people are analyzing the Twitter, Twitter, uh, what, what tweets are getting distributed. And I think they're more accountable and more, more responsible as a result. And so there is a real tie between transparency and the decisions and, and optimizations that these platforms make. The question around encroaching on freedom of speech is very, very important to me. Um, I don't believe that focusing on content-based solutions is sufficient because uh, every time you make a decision that is about content, you now need to have a system that can intervene in the 5,000 languages that exist on Earth. You have to retune and rebuild the AI over and over and over again. And, that, and Facebook hasn't, right? It, it's actually harder to support the third largest language in Ethiopia than it is to do English because the training systems, the, the contractors that we would use to be able to do that um, are, don't exist. Those services don't exist. So we need to think about how we make systematic changes around amplification, how we make social media that is more about our family and friends, because we, li we liked social media when it was about our family and friends, right? I'm not asking you to give up social media. I'm asking you to have human-scale social media. Um, I'll give you an example of um, an intervention that would radically decrease misinformation. If you said, if you have more than 5,000 members in a group, you have to turn on self-moderation. As someone who ran a group that had 3,000 people, I know that that's hard. I know that less content would get out there. And if we know that one of the, the most dangerous kind of amplification levers is half a million, a million person groups, those groups can still exist if their members are so committed to their groups that they're willing to staff the moderators. But with great power comes great responsibility. If you have a medium that can blast out a message to a million people, you know, having some constraints and saying, hey, like, maybe you should moderate for yourself the content, um, I think is an important thing. Um, the last question is around, are these things deliberate? And as I mentioned before, I don't believe they deliberately set out to make a polarization engine. But they have known for years, they've known since at least 2018, that political parties in Europe we're saying we are running more polarized, extreme ideas, at least on social media, because that's the only thing that gets distributed. 
Like if we share a white paper on our agricultural policy, we get crickets now. We used to at least get distribution. And I worry that by the time we reach the ballot box, the options that we even get to choose have been constrained by Facebook because if the entire time you were only able to run extreme ideas or give that the most voice, have you really been given a choice to vote for, for, for like what would reflect your own needs because it's already been filtered by F Facebook's algorithm? So society and, and technology are now intertwined in a way that they've never been intertwined before. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, Martin uh, Schirtevan to take the floor. Martin. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Horgan, for being with us uh, today and for bearing testimony. Uh, on behalf of the left group in the European Parliament, I just want to tell you that we admire your courage to stand up against Facebook and to reveal its business practices that, driven obviously by profit interests, are harmful for consumers' free choice, um, toxic for the mental health of minors, and after all, also dangerous for democracy as such. Uh, your insight in the dealings of Facebook's, um, Facebook comes at the crucial time. As you know, we are, as European lawmakers, now working on a hopefully strong regulation for big tech and working on reining in their monopolistic position related harmful business models. And let me just add very briefly two more aspects to what has been said um, so far. Uh, firstly, I'd like to know if you have ever gained knowledge of decisions taken by the Facebook management or maybe even by Mark Zuckerberg personally that were tailor-made when it comes to the European Union. Have there been decisions taken with special focus on elections taking place in the European Union or elsewhere in Europe, any decisions targeting in particular European consumers, and if so, what were these decisions? And secondly, I'm uh, personally in favor of a ban of uh, targeted advertisement, I think a business model based on the exploitation of sensitive data such as political or sexual orientation or health-related uh, data is not only immoral, I think it should be illegal. Do you think that there is a place in the future digital market for businesses that thrive through the exploitation of personal data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Ms. Hogan, please. Um, I am not aware of any actions that were specifically taken with the European Union in mind, um, other than I know that Germany was considered a, quote, at-risk country um, during their elections, um, during the lead-up to it. Uh, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure the reason why Germany was given that privilege um, or those extra resources was because they feared things like the DSA, right? The other countries on the Atlas that, that were tier one and the at-risk countries are places where, you know, there's people actively killing each other. Um, and so it shows that Facebook invests resources for safety, not based on equity, right? Every election in Europe is important. They should all get supervision with regard to influence operations or things like that. Um, Facebook should have to staff enough security personnel that that's possible because right now those functions are all hidden and how much they're willing to invest in those is hidden. Um, with regard to targeted ads, um, I'm a strong proponent that people should be allowed to make choices with regard to how they are targeted, and I encourage um, prohibiting dark, dark patterns that force people into opting into those things. Um, platforms should have to be transparent about how they use that data, and I'm a big proponent of that. There's a lot. Um, they should have to also publish policies like, do they give flat ad rates for all political ads? Because you know we shouldn't be subsidizing hate in political ads. Um, with regard to will there be businesses that can be successful without exploiting data, um, I strongly believe that Facebook will not be dislodged from what I call personal social media. So there's broadcast social media, which is things like TikTok. People create on TikTok because they want to reach the largest audience possible. The market works for things like TikTok, and you see lots of TikTok clones. YouTube has one, Snapchat has one, Instagram has one. Um, but you don't see clones of Facebook. And the reason for that is in personal social media, people create because they want to reach very specific people. And unless you move the entire friend network sim simultaneously, that's not going to happen. And we can talk about interoperability, but it's outside the scope of this question. Um, I don't think interoperability will work. And so in a world where um, uh, it is almost impossible to escape that center of mass, 
you know, three years ago even, there were still some countries that had alternative personal media. Now there, are, there really aren't any countries except for China because they banned Facebook. Um, and so I, 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 I think there is a space for companies that are more just with information, but we're not going to, we've, we've lost the chance for that world. Facebook is personal social media and will be for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask Maria, Marisa Matias to take the floor, please. Obrigada. I'm going to speak in Portuguese. I'm here in your left. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Muito obrigada. Como estava a dizer, uh, quero começar por agradecer a sua presença. Acho que é muito importante e aproveito também para enaltecer o trabalho que fez, o trabalho que é feito pelos whistleblowers. E nós, neste Parlamento, já dependemos de muito trabalho de whistleblowers para fazer trabalho legislativo. Infelizmente, ainda não demos o passo significativo para a proteção dos whistleblowers. O seu trabalho mostrou que plataformas como o Facebook têm o poder para ignorar qualquer tipo de problema se isso ajudar a proteger o seu negócio. Mostrou também que o Facebook sabia do que se passava, mas decidiu não atuar. Mostrou ainda, entre outras coisas, que o modelo de negócio do Facebook foi um dos responsáveis pelo genocídio no Mianmar. Há várias opções a serem discutidas neste momento no Parlamento Europeu para responsabilizar as plataformas. Entre elas estão os sistemas automatizados de controlo. Nós sabemos que estes sistemas comportam riscos, nomeadamente os riscos de manipulação e de censura. Na sua opinião, é possível um sistema automatizado de controlo de conteúdos distinguir a diferença entre conteúdos ilegais e idênticos e semelhantes? Admite que um controlo a posteriori com supervisão humana seja a única resposta viável ou vê outras alternativas? Há também uma outra questão, que estamos a, uma discussão que estamos a ter, que tem a ver com as responsabilidades individuais na gestão das próprias plataformas. Voltando ao caso de Mianmar, acha que é possível que em situações desta dimensão possam ser os cidadãos individualmente a encontrar medidas para se defender e se proteger? Eu não estou a falar da participação dos cidadãos, estou completamente de acordo com, que se, com a participação dos cidadãos e que eles sejam ouvidos. Mas uma coisa é a participação, outra coisa é terem a responsabilidade de controlar e é sobre isso que gostaria de saber a sua opinião. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Ms. Hogan, please. Um. Before I dive into my answer, I'll do a quick plug for whistleblower protections. Um, we will only need whistleblowers more in the future, right, unless we have substantially more transparency into technology as a whole. And remember, the DSA is going to cover platforms online. It's not going to cover self-driving cars. It's not going to cover other systems that might be harmful. Um, it is extremely important to make sure that there are protections and avenues for whistleblowers of all levels to feel safe coming forward. Um, because technology is only going to accelerate and become more dangerous. Uh, the second question is around automatic control systems. Um, I am extremely skeptical on AI being the solution. Um, this is because it is very difficult to, like AI is not actually intelligent. It, it is, a, I've heard the metaphor that AI is like having a million first graders solve a problem. If a million first graders together can solve it, AI will be great for you. But if it requires context and understanding of a larger sphere, AI is very bad at that. And we see this over and over again in Facebook's own documents. Things like counterterrorism speech being consistently labeled terrorism speech. And that's because the words are similar. They don't understand the nuance and the context. I'm a strong proponent that Facebook should have to disclose all of its safety systems in terms of, you know, are you looking for terrorism content? Are you looking for self-harm? Are you looking for hate speech? What are those systems? And they should have to disclose which languages they exist in, and they should have to disclose the performance of those systems per language. Because the reality is, even when they say they, impl they implement it in something other than English, often they don't do a good job of having it actually be performant. And so requiring things like disclosing a thousand samples at each score percentile 
would give us an ability to come in and say, wow, your terrorism detector is stripping all the counterterrorism out. Um, and you see this over and over again. In the case of Myanmar, you know, I was asked by a journalist who had read through the documents, he said, how is it possible that there is no misinformation classifier in Myanmar, like a system for labeling what is misinformation. And it's because Facebook hasn't really invested in third-party fact-checking there. Like, it's difficult for them to have a misinformation classifier. So this question of, you know, can automatic systems be the solution, I think you have to make these platforms smaller, more human-scale, slower, because that will automatically reduce a lot of the harmful content. And if you focus on these automatic systems, they will not work for the, the most ethnically diverse places in the world, with linguistically diverse places in the world, which are often the most fragile. I guarantee you there's a lot of languages even in Europe that have no safety systems, or they have a very minimal number of safety systems for this reason. Uh, the last question on individual responsibility. Um, I'm a strong proponent of every change should have to have a name associated with it because Facebook has hidden behind its collaborative culture to remove responsibility from anyone. They say committees make the choices, not individuals. And even the action of saying you just have to have a name on each change because someone needs to be able to stand up and say, I believe in this thing. Because today, like that culture of lack of accountability means people also don't push back. They just go with the flow. Thank you. And next, I would like to ask uh, Axel Voss to take the floor. Axel, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, but I would also like to speak in German. Frau Haugen, recht herzlichen Dank für Ihr Kommen und auch von meiner Seite noch mal die Hochachtung für Ihren Mut, den Sie zeigen. Ich möchte gerne ein bisschen diesen Blick in die Zukunft richten. Und zwar glauben Sie, dass die Gefahren für Kinder und Jugendliche, aber auch für unsere Gesellschaft und Demokratie durch die neuen Projekte von Facebook und Zuckerberg, also Stichwort Metaverse, hier noch weiter steigen? Bekommt das noch mal eine andere Qualität, wenn sozusagen Realität und virtuelle Welt miteinander hier mehr verschmelzen? Eine zweite Frage in diesem Aspekt wäre, wir wollen natürlich, wie mit dem DSA schon angesprochen, eigentlich das, was offline illegal ist, auch online illegal machen. Auf der einen Seite sind wir aber in der Diskussion verfangen mit dem Overblocking, Meinungsfreiheit. Es wird, würde zu viel zurückgehalten. Auf der anderen Seite zeigen aber Ihre Enthüllungen eigentlich, dass wir viel konsequenter noch dagegen vorgehen müssten. Deshalb, was würden Sie hier raten, um diese Gefahren auch an Kindern mit, mit schädlich gezielter Werbung ohne aber gezielte Werbung generell zu verbieten? Oder wo wäre hier ein Mittelweg, auch welche Inhalte genau vielleicht wegen der schädlichen Auswirkungen auf Minderjährige nur eingeschränkt zugänglich sein sollten? Sollen wir das benennen, auch gerade im Hinblick noch mal auf die neuen Projekte? Also, Meta, das. Dankeschön, Axel. Uh, Ms. Hauger, please. Mm -hmm. With regard to the change uh, of name for Facebook from Facebook to Meta, um, I am extremely concerned about Meta and meta, the Metaverse, um, partially because I think it illustrates a Meta problem of Facebook, which is they really like to move on. They really like to gr prioritizing growth and expansion over being actually finishing what they build, like making sure it's safe and responsible. So the fact that they can afford 10,000 more engineers to build video games when they can't, allegedly can't afford to have 10,000 engineers working on our safety, I find that unacceptable, and I find it unconscionable. Um, with regard to what the direct harms will be of, of Metaverse, not just these you know, you know, zero-sum things, um, I am very concerned about having lots and lots more sensors in our homes and our offices, because like, to do a lot of this Metaverse stuff, you have to actually expose yourself a lot more. And Facebook has demonstrated that they lie any time it's useful to them. And so the idea that we're supposed to fill our homes and offices with lots more sensors from a corporation that is not transparent uh, and, like, we have no transparency into, I think is a bad idea. 
Um, along with that, in the case of workplaces at least, like people often don't get to opt in on what technology is used by their employer. So if someone says, hey, I've read up on this, I don't feel safe having Facebook have even more data on me. If your employer says, oh, well, we're a metaverse company, like you have to accept that this is how we do voice, you know, how we do meetings, you don't, there's no consent there. And I think that also is dangerous. Um, the only thing that I am excited about metaverse is I think it is much more human scale. So most of the interactions are at the level of one to maybe 10. Um, I think VR becomes pretty overwhelming beyond that point. Um, and, and that's a great illustration of systems that are just intrinsically safer. Like your uncle can have really out there views and he might ruin Thanksgiving, but he's not getting a megaphone to a million people. Right, so by default, when you design human scale systems, you get for free less spread of, of extreme ideas. Um, with regard to uh, blocking more, um, blocking too much free expression, um, I, I, that's part of why I'm saying we need to have samples. Like for any safety system they have, we should be allowed to see a thousand samples at various different scores because I think we would be really shocked at how much good content gets thrown in with the bad content, um, especially on things like counterterrorism versus terrorism. So I'm much more a, a proponent of how do we design systems to be safe um, versus how do we touch the content a lot? Because like I said before, I don't believe um, content-based solutions scale to the most fragile places in the world. Then the last question around um, balance bounced on teen advertising, uh, I think it's a really hard thing because right now Facebook claims that they don't target ads, like that on teenagers, like you can, you can say I want to reach, you know, women who are between 13 and 16 or whatever. Um, but the reality is AI learns biases and AI learns things about you even if you're not aware that it's in those systems. Like they're going to learn keywords in those ads and it's going to act like targeting on vulnerable teenagers. And so um, I think there are ways that you can do that in terms of um, having it be a little bit more like TV, you know, where ads are blasted out to a much more diverse and less confined audience. But as long as AI can learn those relationships, it's going to micro-target. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Tom von der Gendelare. Tom, thank you. the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Hogan. First of all, also from my side, thank you for being here. Uh, it's not only very courageous, but in a way it's also necessary, because Facebook to us functions like a uh, factory, with, with a closed factory with big concrete walls. And you're right, the Digital Services Act will oblige them to put at least some windows uh, in those big concrete walls, they will be obliged to provide insight into the processes of the algorithms that determine what we see and why we see it, and that's an important first step. But I think it, it should not stop there. It's unacceptable, like you said, that Instagram, for example, would encourage eating disorders among teenage girls or that right-wing voters are pushed towards extreme right-wing groups via the algorithm without them actually even realizing it. Now, my questions on algorithms. The first one which I want to ask you is how we as lawmakers with limited knowledge and resources can get a grip on the algorithms of specialized tech giants. How do we ensure that we always stay one step ahead, especially because those algorithms will continue to evolve also? Second question concerns the input for algorithms. Because as I understand it, Facebook collects the data of its users on a large scale and then uses these same data to manipulate these users themselves. Cynical, if you ask me. It raises questions about privacy and about what a data company may use to build their algorithm. So that's why I would like to know from you whether um, we should set limits on the data that Facebook might collect, on the data that Facebook might collect and use as inputs for algorithms. Would a restriction in this way offer a solution? And if so, uh, what data should we keep out of the algorithm? I look forward to your answers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Haugen, please. <laughs> And with regard to this question of how can lawmakers stay one step ahead, especially when these systems change so much, like that's part of why having dynamic systems like the one, two, three audit, safety audits is so important um, because the reality is any fence you put up now, like anything where we say you can't use these three things, in reality we need to be able to continually evolve because these systems evolve so fast. Um, I think that's a, also a reason why Facebook should have to disclose what data goes into things like their ad targeting algorithms or into the, how they rank the newsfeed, right? Being able to disclose, like, these are the factors that were used to prioritize content is important. 
I'm a strong proponent that if Facebook has a fire hose, like we discussed, at least for, for some fraction of the content, um, uh, they should have to disclose what those scoring parameters were. Because if you allowed people like independent researchers and academics to have access to it, they would be able to summarize for you what are the factors that are disproportionately amplifying the worst content. And the reality is right now, a very small number of people inside of Facebook are asking that question because these things are very complicated, right? I, when Facebook says that, they're accurate. Um, to give you a sense of how limited our resource for people who can even analyze these problems, like I'm not, I'm not trying to brag here. I think there's probably on the order of 200 or maybe 300 people in the world who have the depth of awareness that I do around how these systems work. And I think that alone is a national security problem. Like we, we need to figure out ways where we can get more eyes on these systems because right now, many of those people who fall in that category are alumni of Facebook or the alumni of a place like Google. Um, and we have to figure out ways where they can continue to be in the conversation. Because part of why a lot of those people left was because they didn't get to work on keeping people safe enough. Um, with regard to um, uh, like inputs for these systems, uh, I think as we have visibility into how they currently use the data, we will realize data that we feel uncomfortable having in there. Um, and that's part of why we need to involve not just Facebook's own perception of its, its harms. We need to allow community members say, hey, I feel really uncomfortable about whatever parameter is being used there. Because I guarantee you civil society groups will have very different opinions than Facebook will. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, Nathalie Loiseau to take the floor. Nathalie, please. Merci de votre présence parmi nous, vraiment, et de votre témoignage. Il suffit de vous entendre pour comprendre qu'il n'y a rien à attendre de l'autorégulation des plateformes et que nous devons aller vers un cadre normatif beaucoup plus strict. Mais il suffit aussi de connaître les États-Unis et leur approche du premier amendement de la Constitution pour comprendre qu'une véritable régulation ne pourra venir que d'Europe. On peut aussi s'interroger pour savoir si la régulation elle-même sera suffisante. Lorsque le principe même qui fait vivre les réseaux sociaux est celui de la viralité, et qu'en matière d'information comme en médecine, ce qui circule le plus et le plus vite est généralement ce qui est le plus toxique. Suffit-il de réguler les réseaux sociaux ou faut-il intégralement les repenser et pour cela aller jusqu'à les démanteler J'aimerais me concentrer sur la lutte contre la désinformation en ligne. Pouvez-vous nous dire précisément quelle différence fait Facebook sur la modération des contenus selon qu'ils sont diffusés en anglais ou dans d'autres langues selon qu'ils concernent des sujets comme la pandémie de Covid ou des sujets plus politiques, selon que les discours de haine visent des catégories différentes de personnes. À l'intérieur de l'entreprise, dispose-t-on de statistiques précises sur les contenus qui ont été retirés par pays, sur les faux comptes supprimés, et dans quelle mesure ces contenus sont-ils archivés Quelle attention est portée aux manipulations volontaires des outils fournis par Facebook par des intervenants mal intentionnés je pense par exemple à l'achat de publicité ciblée par des organismes de propagande étrangers. Je pense en particulier à l'Internet Research Agency russe. Quelle réaction a eu Facebook ou bien quelle absence de réaction Je voudrais enfin relever que si vous avez accepté de témoigner devant nous aujourd'hui, et nous vous en sommes reconnaissants, les patrons des plateformes, eux, n'ont toujours pas daigné accepter une audition publique devant notre Parlement, et je le regrette profondément. Merci beaucoup pour votre question. Uh, Ms. Hogan, please. Uh, with regard to does Facebook, does social media be just restarted from the beginning, the reality is that Facebook has many tools at its disposal, which it has chosen not to use, that are content agnostic. It doesn't require us to pick good people or good ideas. Like these are, uh, in, uh, these are systems that make this platform slower, that give people more time to think before they reshare, and that has the side effect of less misinformation. That, it, that those ideas that are, when you need jerk share them, uh, they often, but you win if you thought about it a little bit, that it slows those down. Um, some examples are things like I talked about before of like having to click a link before you reshare it or cutting reshare chains. Um, but there are other things like um, uh, 
demoting content that is not from someone you know, right? Even demoting it a little, because the worst things that spread misinformation are how Facebook has pushed people into groups um, that are large, that act like viral variant factories. You know, a group that has a million members and produces a thousand pieces of content a day, that is the, pro the biggest problem, because right now the algorithm picks three of those pieces of content and spreads them out to a million people. But unfortunately, the algorithm differentially picks, they can, it's biased towards polarizing divisive content. So a lot of these things, if Facebook was required to do a, a risk assessment, they had to listen to the community, and they had to articulate how they were going to get better and what data would allow you to hold them accountable that they actually were getting better, they would likely fall back on some of these things. Because for a lot of these things, they don't lose that much profit. They lose slivers, like less than 1%. Because it's true that people consume a little less content when it's safer, but the platform is also a lot nicer. They might actually be more profitable in five years or 10 years because more people would still be on the platform. A lot of people are quitting because it's toxic. Um, but once you have that transparency, once you have to articulate how we're going to deal with these problems, it becomes people inside the company get the space to actually do the right things. Because right now, there is lots and lots of weight pulled towards what's good for the shareholders, and there's not a countervailing force that gives space for people who want to do the right thing to do the right thing. Um, with regard to having to publish what content is taken down, I think that's a great idea because you would learn, and you have to do it by type. Like, it was taken down and why? Because immediately you would learn that lots of stuff is not being taken down in a variety of languages. You'd be like, oh, interesting. You're not actually doing integrity actions in XYZ language. Um, so anything that involves linguistic transparency, I think, is vitally important because right now Facebook is differentially harming on people who don't speak English, and that's unacceptable. Um, the last question is like, how do they distinguish between various forms of content? They use AI systems that allow them to classify, to label those, those things. And uh, the quality is wildly divergent between languages. So again, if the way that they are able to keep these platforms safe is with these AIs, they should have to publish enough data that we feel confident that they are invest they are being equitable in safety. Because right now, they're investing in safety in the United States because they're afraid of being regulated, but they're not investing in safety in places that they aren't afraid. Thank you. Next, uh, I would like to ask Eva Maitel to take uh, the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Ms. Haugen, thank you for your testimony here today and for being with us. Um, I think if we take many messages from you. I think one message you probably uh, can take away with you is that we've heard you. We hear you very well. And um, I think um, it's so brave, but also extremely helpful what you've been doing over the past couple of weeks. Together with many of my colleagues here, I also work on the digital single uh, market and the Digital um, Markets Act, uh, the Services Act and Markets Act, um, because I believe it's important to end this sort of digital anarchy that you also partially described uh, today. But today I'll speak on, uh, uh, in, in my role as sitting in the Special Committee on AI, because you yourself are an AI expert uh, as well. Um, and I think you've, uh, you know, uh, largely addressed that topic uh, in, in the remits of the DSA and the DMA. Um, but um, I think you also have heard that many have used your very uh, helpful, as I said, and also brave whistleblowing to ask for complete bans of AI in various uh, um, um, places, when it comes to advertising, when it comes to recommender system, or even systems meant to remove illegal um, or dangerous content. Um, but I believe, and also what we've heard today, you have warned against the misuse of AI, uh, particularly in the context of Facebook. Um, but I don't have the impression you're asking for complete uh, bans. Um, but uh, rather, as you've a number of times emphasized, uh, you're asking for more transparency to reduce AI usage to where it makes sense for more sensible government uh, regulation and laws, but also for the need for consumers to be able to make 
choices, which I think is very important, and I concur on all of the statements um, that you made. Because I simply don't believe that all the work you have been also doing on AI, um, you would, uh, you know, uh, think it's worthy of banning in one way or, or another entirely. Um, but I also don't think that there, the many young and energetic people that work in startups in, in Europe um, with AI want to act unethically and necessarily. Um, and I think these are the AI developers um, that could work on certain issues to find solutions. And this is why I wanted to hear from you, how do we actually improve the building of the usage of AI for the benefit of mankind? How do we make sure that we get to these systems to be safe, as you said? Um, and you've elaborated on a number of points, but perhaps you could now go a little bit while uh, into the AI itself uh, and not just into the remits of the DSA or the DMA. Here yeah, Eva. Uh, Ms. Hogan, please. Um, I want to be super clear. I, I don't advocate for getting rid of AI. I am more about that, especially in a place like Facebook, where it is effectively our communication platform. It will be the personal social media platform for the foreseeable future, that we can only have AI if we have more transparency on AI. Because right now, like, for example, after my congressional testimony, uh, Mark came out and said, you're worried about extreme and polarizing content? Fine. We'll take all political content out of the news feed. If we don't know how they trained those systems, like what, what were the examples that were considered political, what topics were considered political, and we don't know how those are actually being used, like seeing examples of how things were classified, like that, that can shape our democracies because they're choosing what ideas can, they can't be distributed anymore. Um, so I want to be clear, I'm, I'm advocating for transparency, not for getting rid of AI. Um, with regard to how we can make these systems more generally safer, um, I think thinking about how, how can we generalize requiring people to have some visibility into these systems. Um, uh, I understand the importance of having competitive secrets, but at the same time, um, there are lots of circumstances where people's lives are pretty dramatically affected by decisions that are made by, made by AIs. And if, at a minimum, academics and regulators aren't allowed data access, um, that, I, that I think is unjust. Because the thing that we have seen over and over again is that these things are rarely equitable, right? That you know, African Americans in the United States are routinely highly disadvantaged by these systems. We see that today at Facebook, where on things like Reels, like the AI was never taught racism, but it learned racism by seeing how people responded to different kinds of content. And it noticed, oh, African-American content doesn't get as much engagement. We don't need to show it, right? So these are the kinds of things where we need to have transparency or we'll have unjust systems. Thank you. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, that uh, UK MP Mr. Damian Collins, uh, chair of uh, the UK Parliament's uh, Joint Committee for the Online Safety Bill, is uh, also taking part in our hearing Welcome, uh, Mr. Damon Collins. And uh, before starting with a second uh, round of uh, uh, questions, uh, I proposed uh, to, to make a very short break. Uh, it was asked for five minutes, but uh, for only three minutes. So, <laughs> thank you. Break.
So, dear colleagues, uh, dear guests, uh, it seems uh, we, we can continue. And we can start with our second round of uh, questions and answers. First, I would like to ask uh, Pablo Arias uh, to take uh, the floor. Pablo. Muchas gracias, eh, presidente. Eh, señora Haugen, eh, muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Mire, le hemos aplaudido eh, todos eh, después de su intervención y yo lo he hecho eh, por su valentía eh, al plantar cara a un gigante de Internet como Facebook. Es usted, eh, diríamos los españoles, como Don Quijote de la Mancha, salvo que Don Quijote pensaba que eran gigantes amenazantes cuando eran molinos de viento y nosotros pensábamos que eran molinos de viento cuando realmente son gigantes que pueden estar amenazando nuestro estilo de vida. Estos gigantes nos han venido a ofrecer servicios supuestamente gratuitos. Hoy sabemos que se nutren de nuestros datos, basándose en un modelo de negocio opaco y a veces peligroso, que les da sin duda pingües beneficios. En la Unión Europea estamos trabajando, eh, como sabe, en una iniciativa de reglamento eh, que pretende abordar estos retos. Y me pregunto si cree usted que vamos en la buena dirección. En mi grupo parlamentario, el grupo del Partido Popular Europeo, buscamos soluciones sobre la proliferación, por ejemplo, del contenido ilegal e ilícito en Internet. Es algo que afecta a todos, ya lo hemos eh, escuchado en esta sala también, pero muy especialmente a los niños, como usted misma ha denunciado. Yo soy padre de cinco. Hoy en día cualquiera puede acceder a las redes sociales con un perfil falso y cometer todo tipo de ilegalidades. También lo pueden hacer los menores. Nadie comprueba su identidad. Desde los gigantes de Internet nos dicen que es técnicamente imposible hacerlo, comprobar su identidad, comprobar la identidad de cada usuario. Sin embargo, en el mundo offline... Eh, y aquí ha salido que lo que queremos es, entre otras cosas, que aquello que es ilegal offline debe ser ilegal online y, por tanto, hay muchas prácticas que deberíamos de traspasar de un lado a otro, las empresas están obligadas a verificar la identidad de sus clientes, por ejemplo, los bancos, las eléctricas o los operadores de telecomunicaciones. Si uno no está detrás de un contrato, no le dan una línea telefónica ni de datos ni de voz. Por tanto, yo creo que no solo es posible, sino que también es necesario. Y en este sentido, no cree que las autoridades competentes deben ser o poder ser capaces de identificar de forma ágil a cada usuario de servicios digitales. Sabemos que con el IP eh, no es suficiente. No estoy en contra del anonimato, que declaro. Todos podemos ser anónimos de cara al resto de usuarios en la red para proteger la libertad, por ejemplo, de expresión o a las minorías. ¿Cree que es acertado y técnicamente posible que todos los usuarios tengan que ser identificados por las autoridades competentes? Por supuesto, siempre protegiendo sus datos personales con la GDPR, por ejemplo, aquí en Europa. Y desde una perspectiva moral, que también ha salido la cuestión, y teniendo en cuenta que los algoritmos deben estar protegidos por el principio de secretos industriales, ¿cómo cree usted que debemos abordar la transparencia de los algoritmos para proteger nuestro estilo de vida? Muchas gracias. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, Ms. Haugen, please. Um, I'll hit on something from the end of that question first. So this question of, you know, algorithms are trade secrets and we have to protect them. Um, any law that allows us to not disclose data in order to protect trade secrets is, is going to fail. Right, like Facebook is going to do exactly what you described, and they are going to wrap themselves in trade secrets and say, you know, we can't show you any data on our algorithm because that will violate our trade secrets. Um, so I think having some some um, discretion on that is, is an important thing. Um, but with regard to age verification, um, I would like to introduce an idea to you, to you that may not be obvious, which is there is a difference between a stated age and an estimated age. So when we shared documents with Congress, one of the staffers came back and said, does this chart mean 10 to 20 percent of 10-year-olds are on Facebook? Um, and it was a cohort chart. It looked at each birth year. And it using, and I looked at it, I was very confused initially. I was like, how, how could they know this? And then it clicked for me. Facebook had gone and l looked at each of those users' friends They looked at their interests, various things, and they were able, you're able to with great precision guess what someone's age is based on, because most, most people don't lie about their age. Enough kids wait to join the platform that you can get a good estimate of what the actual age of people is. Facebook should have to publish what fraction of 
people under, were under 13, what, at what age did they come on the platform for each cohort? So for every year when kids turn 13, 14, Facebook can now publish a backward state and say what fraction of those people of 14-year-olds on the platform, what fraction of them were on the platform at 10, 11, 12? Because that will allow us to know, did they do a good enough job of keeping kids off the platform? Today, we don't have any yardstick. We have to just trust them. And so at a minimum, I believe they should have to disclose that estimated age data. The second question is around how can we uh, verify kids' ages without having to give up anonymity? So anything that requires us to provide identification, I think, is a solution that will fail. Because the reality is most places in the world do not have highly database identification. Um, and people, as long as they can have a VPN, will go into those other, go into those other countries and register accounts. Because Facebook's not going to give up on growth from, you know, a large swath of the world. And so if you have any system that is around, you have to verify identity, I think people will just go around it. Um, because Facebook is also not going to, you know, fence in those users and say, you come from Africa, therefore you can't talk to people in Europe, right? I, I just don't think it will happen. I do think, though, there are solutions like um, you can, there are now service providers that you could do this even on a device. It doesn't even have to go to Facebook, where uh, taking a picture of someone, they can estimate your age for kids within about half a year, right? And so Facebook has lots of tools it could be using. They should have to publish data that confirms that you're actually doing enough. Um, and they should have to also disclose what are they doing, because then academics, independent researchers can say, here are all the other tools that you might want to use. Thank you. Next, uh, I would like to invite Evelyn Keppard to take the floor. Bitte schön. Ja, danke schön. Ich werde Deutsch sprechen. Deswegen warte ich jetzt. So, ja, ja, danke schön. Und vielen Dank, dass Sie gekommen sind, um uns zu erzählen, wie die Wirklichkeit in diesem Rahmen tatsächlich aussieht. Und das ist für uns äußerst wichtig und von großer Nützlichkeit, weil wir ja gerade mitten in der Gesetzgebung sind und ich selber ja auch für die SDMA auch zuständig bin, für meine Fraktion. Und äh, wir diskutieren natürlich, und ich möchte gerade auf etwas zurückkommen, was Sie in einer der Antworten gesagt haben, äh, nämlich, dass es eigentlich interessant wäre, wenn wir mehrere oder viele kleinere Plattformen hätten, so dass ein Wettbewerb da ist, um äh, die Marktmacht des Einzelnen auch wirklich zu, ähm, zu verhindern. Sie sagen auch immer wieder, naja, ob, wir das, ob das gelingen kann. Es gibt ja verschiedene Dinge, die wir ja versuchen zu diskutieren, um eben genau diesen Wettbewerb da hineinzubringen in diesen Bereichen. Da geht es unter anderem um die Interoperabilität auch von sozialen Medien. Da haben wir noch eine heftige Diskussion. Ich selber bin dafür, andere sind es nicht. Und da versuchen wir, das durchzusetzen, weil eben durch die Interoperabilität tatsächlich auch geführt, dazu führen könnte, dass man von anderen Plattformen hin auch Einfluss nehmen kann. Das wäre eine gute Sache. Eine andere Möglichkeit wäre das Verhindern von gezielter personalisierter Werbung. Denn das ist ja auch eines der ganz großen Gefahren. Die Manipulation von Menschen durch diese gezielte Werbung ist ja eines der ganz großen Probleme, die Sie ja auch aufgezeigt haben. Es ginge auch das Thema des Verbotes von sogenannten Killer Acquisitions, so dass auch tatsächlich auch Start-ups, die etwas Neues bringen, auch weiter bestehen können und nicht weg gekauft werden, sage ich jetzt einfach mal, um Wettbewerb zu verhindern. Es geht aber auch eben auch um den Zugang zu den Daten. Wer hat Zugang zu den Daten? Wie dürfen wir diese Daten benutzen? Können diese kreuzüberstreichend denn tatsächlich noch genutzt werden? Das sind solche Diskussionen, die wir haben. Und es würde mich interessieren, was Sie dazu zu sagen haben. Danke schön. Ms. Haugen, please. Um, to be really clear, what I said earlier was that I did not expect smaller platforms to emerge because there are lock, locked in network effects. And that is why the few countries that did have their own systems. So for personal social media, creators create because they want to reach specific people. 
And so the only way you can have competition is if you could bring that whole network with you wherever you want. Um, interoperability, I think, opens up far bigger problems than we currently have today and would require a much deeper level of regulation. I'll give you an example. Let's all imagine we're email servers. So email has inter interoperability. But if I want to send an email to someone on your server, I don't have to broadcast it out to every email server in the world. It just goes to one server. And we have a contract that is easy to enforce. Once an email leaves my server and goes to your server, I can never call it back. I've committed. We have certain expectations with social media where, like, let's imagine my friends scatter across 50 social networks. So there's Facebook, there's New Book, there's New Book 2, New Book 3. If we have interoperability, because uh, we have an expectation that our social media loads really quickly, right, if things don't happen almost instantaneously, people, people leave. Um, to have interoperability, when I post a picture of my baby on New Book, it will get broadcast out to the 50 other platforms that my friends are scattered across. And that sounds fine. You're like, oh, good. Now we can all have our own rankings, our own filterings. But it becomes a problem if I ever want to take that content down. So let's say two years go by, and I no longer want pictures of my children on social media. I have to trust that when my new book contacts those 50 platforms and says, you need to delete that content, that it's actually deleted we would have to do a very invasive level of regulation of all the Facebook clones to ensure that they actually complied with how they were operating. How do we know that that server wasn't built by Russia, right? They built a social network, they funded it because they were never gonna delete the content, right? There's a lot of these dangers where it may not be obvious why interoperability is, 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 is probably much more of a mixed bag and much harder to do in a way that is actually functional. That's part why I advocate for the one, two, three approach on risk assessments and getting transparent access to data. Um, with regard to excessively personal targeted information, I think there's interesting conversations to be had on how to simplify those models to try to avoid as many rabbit holes pushing people towards them. Um, and with regard to acquisitions, I encourage you to think more broadly than just the obvious other social platforms with regard to banning acquisitions by Facebook. One of the most important startups in terms of holding Facebook accountable was CrowdTangle. So CrowdTangle had a way of, of monitoring what happened on Facebook, and Facebook bought it. And when researchers started to notice how toxic Facebook was by using CrowdTangle, Facebook shuttered that team. Like, it still exists, but they've stopped developing it, and they likely will, will close it in the future. So when you're thinking about what acquisitions to not allow to protect competitiveness or protect accountability, you need to also look at, should Facebook be allowed to buy startups that hold it accountable? Because if they buy it, they can kill it. And then the last question on data access and how it can be used, I strongly, I'll repeat again, I strongly encourage you to include the independent researcher community. You can have an accreditation process, that's totally fine, but I encourage you to have some avenue for participation because we need to build the ecosystem of accountability. Because remember, you know, let's say someone like me isn't interested in going to a university, but we're really interested in running a YouTube channel. That could actually inform consumers and give them choices by translating this complex information into something they could consume. So I encourage you to be inclusive in who gets data. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, Lisha uh, to take the floor. Lisha. Thank you very Please. much, Chair, and thank you, Mrs. Haugen, um, for coming here and sharing your views with us. Uh, your revelations have confirmed my belief that we've let online platforms make up their own rules and regulations for too long. Uh, and with your call for more transparency and democratic oversights, uh, you are really preaching to the choir in this house. And I would also like to address the youngest users of social media platforms, because we know that one in three Internet users is below the age of 18, uh, we also know that the Internet was never designed with children in mind. And while platforms have opened up many opportunities for children to learn, to communicate, to develop, uh, their de design more often than not still goes after the data of these youngest uh, users. So children are now leaving digital footprints behind many times the size of their own shoe size. And besides this, you, you have also warned for harmful content that is uh, served up to these minors. 
Um, and uh, I have listened to your answer on the age verification uh, very clearly, and thank you for this. I was very interested uh, in this. But I'm also very interested to hear how you think that we should really secure the safety and rights of our children online, and whether you have concrete proposals to improve platforms, services for children, um, and notably in the data processing. And because you have had the chance to look at the research that Facebook has been done, uh, has done, do you think that we can really uh, cater to children and what they really understand that they are giving up uh, uh, in uh, trading for, uh, for free games, for example? Uh, do they know what they are doing and can we uh, somehow uh, make this clear to children? So thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Ms. Hogan, please. I think it's very important for us to acknowledge the, uh, the network of influences that a child faces when they use things like Instagram. So because it is the default platform for people under 18, uh, people uh, feel a fear, like Facebook's own research says. You know, kids say, I know it makes me unhappy. I know I, 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 I don't want to use it as much as I do. I can't stop myself. And the most important one, and I fear being ostracized if I leave. Right, that if I leave in isolation, if I make a choice for myself, I will be cut off from my friends and family. People are willing to do some pretty self-harming things if it means they can keep their friends. Right, and we see this with teenagers every day. Peer pressure is a real thing. Um, I think it's important when we think about how to secure the rights of young people that we keep that in mind. That we really need systems level solutions, not you know blaming parents because kids use social media. Um, I think one of the most important ways that we can help protect the rights of young users is by giving parents better resources. So one of the things from Facebook's research is that kids, because their parents did not come of age during a time when Instagram was ubiquitous, that you find that parents often give really harmful advice to their kids or advice that makes kids feel alone. Right? So parents will uh, just say, like, why don't you just not use it? Or they might get angry at their child because their child can't, can't stop using it. And so I think there's a lot of value in trying to get better information into the hands of parents so that if we can't get the platform safer, at least parents can try to help their kids more. Um, because right now, we're expecting parents to know about neurobiology, and that's, un that's unreasonable. Um, with regard to can children understand what they're trading away, um, I think almost certainly kids, like we don't, we as adults, we don't know what we've traded away, right? We don't know what goes in the algorithms. We don't know how we're targeted. So the idea that children can be, give informed consent, I, I, like, I don't think we give informed consent and they have less capability. Um, I think there's a real need, like in terms of research to be funded. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm most intrigued by is there's a misinformation researcher out of Singapore and she's an anthropologist. And she had some of the most interesting observations on how misinformation was being conducted that we would have never been able to discover on our own. And the way she found it was by just interviewing kids. I think funding more research where we ask kids about their lived experience of social media is really important because right now Facebook is going to be discouraged from doing research like that because of my disclosure, right? Though I don't take responsibility for it because their cowardice is not my fault. Um, and so, yeah, investing more in listening to children, I think, is really valuable if we want to protect their rights. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to ask uh, Deirdre Kloon to take the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ms. Hagen, for being with us today. Um, and I hope this is the start of more, we have other opportunities as well. So thank you. And um, I would... I'd like, I, one of the points I wanted to raise actually was minors, and I think the comments you've made um, really will, will, will highlight the fears that so many parents have of how their children can be and their young people can be manipulated um, online. And I wanted to ask you, if you were Mr. or Ms. Facebook making decisions, what would you do? How could you change it? And just give us an insight into how Facebook uh, approach um, or, or, or they think about their approach, approach to minors 
that would be most interesting. And actually, uh, your comments about the DSA, uh, I mean, um, I think are very encouraging for us. I know I'm just looking at the words we have describing it as transparency, oversight, accountability, risk assessment is there, uh, access for researchers, even though I, I take your point that maybe there's so many more out there, so much more expertise out there that we could be availing of to, to, um, to data. I think that's all, that, so that's very, very encouraging. I fear that, you know, we'll, they'll always be one step ahead of us. And so how can we future-proof our legislation, and uh, bearing in mind it's not just about Facebook, it's about other, other platforms as well. Uh, I think that that would be important for us because I think we have a, a lot of key parameters are there. It's just we need, if we can, we never, we never, I know we never will, I will always be behind, but really to, to future-proof it I think would be very important for us. And just a small, another point, if I could ask if Facebook changed its algorithms in 2018 to emphasise um, meaningful social interactions and to give more weight to uh, resharing and to friends. Uh, did that work or what happened to that? Or, or just, did, did it work? I, think, I, I don't think it probably didn't, but uh, just um, why was that decision taken in 2018 and did it work? So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hogan, please. Uh, with regard to how can we future-proof the DSA, um, I believe there's a lot of power in having a one, two, three approach. So that means they can disclose risks. The community identifies risks because listening to different groups is going to give us more things that we need to flag. And Facebook should propose solutions, but we should hold them accountable that those are rigorous solutions. And they should have to disclose data that would allow us to track progress on those solutions. If you don't have all three parts, I don't think it'll be effective. But if you do have all three parts, developing that cycle where data is continuously disclosed, that's something we need to that I think I encourage you to modify in the DSA. If they pull data for you once, it's easy for them to pull it every week because they have already written the queries to pull that information. So if they tell you, oh, it's too onerous to do it twice a year, guess what? Giving you a stream where they just rerun the same queries every week, it's, it's very little additional work for them. So don't, I encourage you to be questionable on that. That process of having, uh, building an ecosystem of contributors, having data that regularly comes out so we can monitor when step changes happen, because I, I, I saw over and over again at Facebook that they would have regressions that a feature would launch that no one could have anticipated was going to greatly amplify misinformation. But I guarantee you if 10,000 people were watching those streams, they would notice that something had changed. And so it is important to build the ecosystem. So the next question is around MSI. So MSI was done specifically for business interests. So they claim they wanted to increase meaningful social interactions, but those interactions could have been hate speech, it could have been bullying. Today, they only fixed that part for English in November 2020. Right, if you did bullying or hate speech in the comments, they still counted as a meaningful social interaction. And for the vast majority of languages in the world today, and I guarantee you a majority of European languages, you can do hate speech in the comments today and it's still considered a meaningful social interaction. The reason why Facebook did that change was they had tried many, many things to get people to produce more content because people were starting to produce less and less because it was so toxic. And what they found was the only thing that worked that had the least side effects was giving you more little hits of dopamine. That if you got more likes, more comments, more reshares, you produced more content. And they ran experiments on creators to figure this out. When they went and did surveys after the fact, so six months down the line, they found that people said their feeds were less meaningful after they implemented meaningful social interactions. Because like we have talked about repeatedly during today's session, when you prioritize for content that can provoke a reaction, you end up biasing towards extreme, polarizing, divisive content. We have seen political parties picked up on this, publishers picked up on this. Like Facebook's own research says that when you use engagement-based ranking like this, you end up seeing that um, the more toxic your comment thread is, like the more negative the comment thread is, the more likely they click out to your site. And I guarantee you publishers notice this. Right, uh, BuzzFeed, which is a large, large outlet in the United States, they wrote to Facebook and said, the content that we're the least proud of is the content that gets the most distribution on Facebook. You clearly have a problem. But because they needed it to get people to keep creating content, that's why they kept, kept it in place. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, Kim van Sparentak to take the floor. Kim? Thank you very much, and also thank you to uh, Madam Hogan for uh, being here today. 
Um, I think you've explained it very clearly. For years, Facebook has profited from the large-scale spread of disinformation and hate. And what we see online is driven by clicks, interaction, and profit. And this means recommender algorithms are programmed to show people content that sparks anger, hate, and even sends people down rabbit holes of radicalization. Facebook knows the impact of their algorithm but refuses to do anything about it. And this only reaffirms what we already know. It's time for strong rules. My group, the Greens, and I fully agree with you that to hold companies accountable, we have to know what is actually going on. We need to understand in detail how these algorithmic systems work, how they are optimized, and how they are influenced. Only then we can take the power over what happens online out of the hands of private companies and place it firmly back in the hands of the people. But tech companies and some right-wing politicians frame such transparency as an unreasonable burden for companies. And you've already also touched upon this trade secrets issue. So my first question is, could you explain to us how feasible it is to have transparency of recommender algorithms and reporting on content moderation for companies? And yeah, knowing what happens is a crucial first step, but holding platforms accountable and giving users more control is the next step. Transparency alone will not be enough if people cannot act upon this information and if nobody holds platforms accountable. So my second question to you is, how do you think we can empower people and give the public more control over what they see online? And which role could independent oversight, researchers, and civil society play as a part of the solution? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Haugen, please. So with regard to how feasible is it for them to provide data, I think it's important for us to differentiate between the first time they do it and the ongoing times. It is likely that for the foreseeable future, many of the things that are flagged via the risk assessment will continue to be problems, right? And so, yes, the first time they may need to write that the way we get data out of these systems is via a query, right? We query the system. They will have to write many queries likely the first time, though many of them will be things they already have. They will have already run this analysis somewhere, and they have, at least Facebook has a search engine that lets them find those queries. Um, each additional time, it is likely that they won't have to write as many queries because many of the problems are likely going to stay the same time to time. We might need to ask slightly different questions of what information we would need to know to get progress because it's likely once that data is published, once those streams are released every week, ongoing basis, that people will begin to say, oh, interesting, actually I wanted it a little bit different. And the next time around, you can tweak it. Um, we are, we're not asking for something unreasonable. This is something that Facebook can totally provide. And I think the thing that is exciting to me is I think actually having more transparency on data would likely bring more employees to Facebook. When I worked at Yelp, um, I was really sh sh struck by how did Yelp staff itself? So Yelp is one of the only companies that releases a real user data set. It shows you reviews from, I think it's like 15 college towns in the United States. And it's used across the United States, across the world, as a data set to teach people machine learning, to teach them how to analyze language computationally. And a huge fraction of Yelp's employees said, the reason I decided to work at Yelp, why I did an internship at Yelp, was because I took a class where I used Yelp's data, and I was so intrigued by what I found that I chose to work here. I think that one of the top challenges for Facebook is that people don't want to work there right now. They are in a feedback cycle where because they've cut corners, they have scandals, which makes it harder to hire, which makes them cut more corners, which causes more scandals. They're, this is just getting worse. And unfortunately, what I, my disclosure will likely make it worse too. I think there's a real thing that if you know more young people were exposed to these data streams in college classes, and I guarantee you college classes will be taught about these data streams, especially if they come out weekly, monthly, whatever is the appropriate frequency to still protect privacy. And I think it might light a generation on wanting to work at Facebook. I think there's a real opportunity there. Um, with regard to improving control, um, control is really hard in isolation. So if we just let people opt into having a different ranking, there's major limitations with that. Because, for example, I often endorse what I call chronological plus plus, so ordering by time, but having intelligible modifications. Like if you post a lot, if you spam, demoting people. That's the thing that we can, can actually understand by looking at as humans. Um, if you just do that change, but you don't change any of the other things about the product, it won't work. 
right? Because Facebook has pushed people into million person groups and they will get spammed by the group, right? It's about changing features in concert. And I think when you have a risk assessment that's like a one, two, three style, Facebook will have to think more holistically about how to solve these problems. I also think it's um, uh, dangerous to expect individuals to understand these issues enough when they're so complicated that they would adequately be able to protect themselves. If you just have a thing where if people choose between two different rankings uh, and, like, and one's a lot more fun, like people will opt for the hyper-optimized one that has all, Facebook has all the data and all the control on. Um, and so I, I don't think users will get the, the product that they deserve um, if we just expect, you know, the market to solve for it. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask uh, Marco Campomenosi to take the floor. But uh, I have a bad news. So it seems uh, that uh, we will not have time for, Q, uh, for catch the eye session. Uh, if uh, those uh, questions will be shorter and answers will be also shorter, then uh, maybe, but now it seems uh, that no uh, catch the eye. So, uh, Marco, please. Hi, Mia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to be here. Um, I, I think that the, the most important question is also uh, who is entitled to define what is a fake news or when we are in front of a violation, and I'm convinced that a public authority has to take this role. Uh, but it's important also that you know which is the situation in Europe, because... Uh, uh, for fiscal reasons, uh, the major uh, platforms are all based in Ireland, and uh, the Irish authorities cannot uh, uh, give an answer to all the procedures started. 99% of, of, of the appeals are not prosecuted. And the EU member states' national authorities have to find uh, back doors in order to solve this question. The Italian uh, authority on data protection uh, had to intervene on TikTok regarding an important issue, which was uh, uh, the, the, the way uh, of the consent given by children uh, with less than 14 years old. And they had to find the so-called urgency procedure given by Article 66 of the GDPR regulation. A German authority did the same on another topic, and also the Belgian authority has been authorized in order to solve the question, because if not, it was not uh, possible to do elsewhere. Of course, I told you, I, uh, I think public authorities have to intervene. But, of course, we have also to intervene on, on, uh, on the platforms. Um, we have, on one side, the risk in having an intervention which is too strict, uh, there is to have on one side overblocking, filter, the creation of filter bubbles, or the complete cut of the political debate. Uh, Facebook does not want to, anymore to have a political debate. It's not business for them. On the other side, stricter rules could, could be and become a barrier uh, for the possibility to, for startups to enter in this special market. And this is also, as legislators, something on which we should intervene. And I hope that this will be done. I, I don't know if you have an opinion on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Haugen, please. Thank you. Um, I'm a strong proponent for having tiered regulations, um, because you're right. Like, startups have less resources to execute in systems like this. But in a world where Facebook will be the only form of personal media, like large-scale personal media, social media, for the foreseeable future, um, I think having exemption or like having higher standards for Facebook or like in the case of Google for advertising, I think that's appropriate. Um, so having tiers for regulations I think is really valuable for that reason. Um, with regard to the challenges of having enforcement be all, uh, giving Ireland the burden of having to enforce all these rules, because you're right, most of the tech companies are out of Ireland. Um, I think there's a real, real need um, for there to be some kind of centralized authority in Europe. Because like I said before, like if there's only maybe 200 or 300 people in the industry who have enough experience and insight around how these systems work and what the consequences of them are, um, if we expect to, to spread them across 27 agencies, um, I think that's, it's going to be very ineffective. Like it's not, you're not going to get the critical mass in any one place. 
Um, I think there is also that conflict of interest factor that Ireland benefits a lot from having those tech companies there. And I think it puts them under unfair pressure to have to uh, hold those things in tension. Because I'm sure Ireland cares about the safety of our children. Ireland cares about our democracies being threatened. But they also have um, extreme pressures being exerted against them, which shows the need for a central, central oversight. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to ask Maria Manuel Tao Marcus to take the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for uh, what you have done and for being here today with us. And let me go straight to my questions. Facebook papers prove Facebook, now Meta, knows it's causing harm and choose not to act. Uh, therefore, we must have hard regulation to guide innovation away from harmful results, as you are doing in Europe. Last week, I was in Washington having meetings with the Congress and the White House, and I felt a large gap between the U.S. and the EU approach to regulation. In your view, how should we bridge this gap and create a democratic model to the digital ecosystem, who has to move closer to the other. I also want to talk about business model. We can't expect different outcomes without change to the business model. As Zuckerberg said, Senator, we sell ads. So it's not a surprise that I'm referring to ads and micro-targeting and behavioral advertising in particular. Social media sells as an utopia. Given enough data, it will perfectly predict the behavior of users and match it with the products being sold to them, to the benefit of users and business alike. However, what we have is a dystopia. Not only there is little evidence of benefits for businesses, but we ended up with an industry of surveillance and mass data collection that give rise to vulnerabilities for individuals, groups, and even political systems. You say you uh, would like to give people choices. I agree, but it's more subtle than that. First, I don't think people really are able to consent to data collection and use it uh, and use with full knowledge of what that means, what data, who is collecting, how they are using it. And second, even if I choose to share my own data, that will contain information about the people I interact with. So I shouldn't, it shouldn't really be only my choice. Some of us here in the Parliament think we need to put a stop to micro-targeting and behavioral advertising and the data collection that it implies. I would like very much to hear from you about this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Hogan, please. I think there's a large opportunity to bring the United States and the European Union closer together. Um, in that, you know, what I've said repeatedly is that I don't support having a regulator that comes in and says, we know how to do social media better than Facebook, but I do believe that consumers have the right to know what they're actually using. And the thing about risk assessments, especially risk assessments that are publicly published and having data where we can independently verify that they're actually making progress is it allows people to make choices on the products they use. That, that's really, really important. And I think that idea, the idea that the regulator's job is to make sure that Facebook's telling the truth and like has a process where they have to, they actually have to reflect on what's happening. And you know, the thing that's great is if Facebook doesn't exhibit progress, then people actually get a choice on whether or not they want to keep using it, or they can put other forms of pressure on Facebook. Facebook has hidden this data because they know it's bad. Right? They know that if more people knew what was actually happening on the platform, they would put more pressure to change Facebook. And I think that kind of lens where you say, hey, this is not so much about a regulator telling you what to do and more about you should just have to be honest about what you're doing and we're going to make sure we have a process where every six months you have to come clean. I think that's a thing that a lot of people in the United States could sign on for. 
right? Um, because, you know, there's more of a bias in the United States of like at least, you know, you can't have a free market if people don't know what they're buying. We have, for example, nutri nutritional policies where people have to publish the ingredients on their food. It's the same thing. We're just asking for the information ingredients in this case. With regard to choices, um, uh, you know, in the case of um, tracking on Apple products, so Apple recently forced um, advertise or for forced apps to disclose, like, do they do tracking and make people opt into it? It's something like 80% of people choose not to opt in. So the question is around making sure we don't have dark patterns that force people into systems. And I do agree with you on this question of like often my actions might bleed information about my friends. But I think if we required platforms like Facebook to disclose what goes into their ad targeting, then we would know whether or not they're using factors that would cause that kind of bleed over. Um, with regard to micro-targeting, uh, I think there are specific things in ads that really need to be regulated. So, for example, given the current system subsidizes hate, you know, it's five to ten times cheaper to run a political ad that's hateful than a non-hateful ad, I think you need to have flat rates for ads. I think that's definitely a thing. Um, but I also think there should be regulation on targeting ads to specific people. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but right now you can target specific ads to an audience of 100 people. And I'm pretty sure this is being misused because I did analysis on who is hyper exposed to political ads. And unsurprisingly, the people who are most exposed are in Washington, D.C., and they are radically overexposed. We're talking thousands of political ads a month. And so I do think having mechanisms to target specific people um, without their knowledge, I think, is, is unacceptable. Thank you. Next speaker is Nikolas Pexa. Nikolas. Thank you. Uh, dear Ms. Hogan, uh, first let me thank you for your coming here today and for your bravery in standing up against the practices that encourage hate and division in our society. However, we are not here only to listen and try to understand what went wrong in one of the most influential social media companies in the world. We are also here to find a way forward. Uh, so I would like to hear your opinion on the following questions. Uh, first, in your view, uh, what can the European Union do to better protect legally whistleblowers, especially in big multinational companies like Facebook is? Uh, secondly, uh, the current proposal for the Digital Services Act, uh, as I put forward in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, uh, such as that the recommender systems should have a clear option to be used without personal profiling. How do you see this change? Uh, will it help to alleviate the issues connected with the current practice of driving for higher engagement through conflict uh, between the users? Thirdly, um, regarding data profiling and data retention, uh, platforms are profiling users, uh, collecting and analyzing their every action, uh, building up their profiles and then creating algorithms to make them stay longer on the platform in order to make them more emotionally invested. Do you believe this is appropriate or even ethical? And uh, lastly, uh, your public statements have revealed a lot of inner working of Facebook. Uh, however, uh, we cannot solely rely on the on whistleblowers. Uh, we also need much more systemic transparency. Uh, do you consider the proposed provisions on transparency of algorithms for public and NGOs, uh, open research and independent oversight sufficient, or should Europe be more ambitious, uh, I mean, in sense of legal uh, lawmaking? Thanks for, for any opinions you could share with us. Thank you. Ms. Helgen, please. With regard to... Uh, whistleblower protections. Uh, I, I believe that there is a need for stronger whistleblower protections across the EU because not all member states have whistleblower protections. Um, and I want to, and even in the United States, for example, in the United States, I was protected under the, the Securities and Exchange Commission because I worked for a public company. Had I worked for TikTok and had the same information, I would have had no, um, I would have no legitimate way to bring forward that information, um, or wouldn't have the same protections. There's a need for protecting both public and private employees. Um, there's also a need for having more on ramps to disclosure. If I had driven a bus in the United States or worked at a hospital, there would have been a phone number that was legally mandated to be in my break room that said, did you see something that endangered public safety? Call this number, 
Someone will take you seriously, well, and you'll be, you'll be safe. Nothing like that exists in Europe, and nothing exists like that in the United States. I had concerns about national security because I was working on counterespionage. I think Facebook has radically underinvested in major national security issues, and I'm happy to talk to any of you about this later. Um, and I had no, I had no idea on who I could talk to. And I think that's really, I think the human cost of that is something that's hard to understand, where when you have to hold a secret that you know is jeopardizing people's lives, and you have no way to reconcile that, that destroys people, and I watched that happen to my coworkers. Um, with regard to profiling and data retention, I think it shouldn't, you shouldn't be allowed to take third-party data sources, something Facebook does. They work with credit card companies, other forms, um, and it makes their ads radically more profitable. I don't think you should, I think you should have to consent to every time you hook up more data sources, because I think people would feel really uncomfortable if they knew Facebook had some of the data that they do. And there's people who aren't even on Facebook who I've, I've I, I don't know if this is a current thing, but I've watched documentaries and read articles where they say they have shadow profiles for people who aren't yet on the platform, where because they have these sources of like credit card data and things like that, they can form profiles on people. Um, and lastly, on this question of can you be more ambitious with data? I think having a process that is dynamic where we change our data asks over time and we match them to problems, people often get fixated on the idea that we need raw data. We need access to all the raw data. And as someone who has done a lot of data analysis of social media networks, raw data, I think, opens a lot of a can of worms around privacy. Um, and is very hard to work with. Like the scale of Facebook's data is, in, is just amazing. Having a system where people, we assess problems both on, by Facebook and by the community, that's the one and the two, and we have to publish aggregate data that would show progress, I, I think a lot of learnings and, and um, our ability to understand how these systems work would happen as a side effect of the data we ask for, because there's often many, many questions you can answer with a set of data, not just the original one that you asked. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask Rob Ross to take the floor, please. Thank you, Chair, and a special thank you to you, uh, Ms. Hogan, for being uh, here with us today. Thank you for your presentation and your courage to bring out the information you have revealed. I know from my own experience that it's much easier to remain silent than to speak out. Ms. Hogan, I have several concerns and hope your answers will help us to tackle these very important challenges. I listened to your presentation and your appearance in the media, and I wonder what you see as the biggest problem. Is it misinformation or is the algorithm showing targeted misinformation to specific users, making them addicted to the platform and further polarizing our society? I ask this because regulating transparency about algorithm algorithms is probably easier to address than topics as misinformation and also hate speech. I understand that these forms of information can be a real problem, but the definitions are, at the end of the day, somewhat arbitrary. And I also fear a world where users can only take notice of the official truth. Should we include in the DSA that platforms give users an option to completely opt out of any content suggested by algorithms. So by giving users the possibility to choose for a real timeline without any suggestion by algorithms of the platform or the platform. In addition, I have an open question. It, is, it has to do with the mental side uh, effect of Instagram. Uh, this is a major problem with even resulting in suicide by young girls. Do you have suggestions on what we should do to tackle that problem? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Hogan, please. I have repeated frequently that I don't believe the problem with Facebook is bad people or bad content. It is about a system that like, consistently has a bias towards amplifying, giving the largest reach to the most extreme and divisive content. That's, that's the real problem here. Um, Facebook has known this since at least 2018 when they rolled out uh, meaningful social interactions. They know that it has influenced publishers, it's influenced political parties, and they know that it is a recurrent problem on their platforms. So I, I think it's about the system and the systematic choices. I think this idea of allowing people to opt out of algorithms, I, I think people should have more control. For example, um, there was an independent person who wrote an extension that allowed you to unfollow things. 
Something that most people are not aware of is Facebook right now, if you are invited to a group, and in the case of invites to groups, because their rate limits are so high, um, the top person that invited people to QAnon groups invited 300,000 people to QAnon groups. They did not consent to being invited. But Facebook then inserted content from those groups into their feed. So imagine someone comes along and says, we're going to help you unfollow things that you're following, and it's going to be one click. F Facebook threatened to sue that person. Right, because they know they need to keep you in those systems if you're going to consume enough content. They don't want you choosing what you look at. They want to feed you that content. I don't, though, support uh, allowing people just to opt out of using algorithms because you can't disentangle product choices and algorithms. So, for example, if people don't opt out of all those groups they're in or unfollow you know, a variety of things, um, You'll, you'll now get spammed by those mega groups, right? So uh, if you are a member of a million person group, you'll get a fire hose of all the content from that group every day. And so just opting out of the algorithm won't solve the problems that we're, we're, we're discussing right now. Lastly, on the mental effects for teenagers, um, or mental health, mental health effects overall, because something that I don't think has been talked about enough is the role of Facebook on things like depression. Right? One of the top risk factors for being overexposed to misinformation is being recently widowed or recently divorced or moving to a new city. So Facebook is showing the most misinformation to people who are already socially isolated. And I think that's problematic. They know that being depressed makes you it correlates with you consuming more content on Facebook. But in the case of teenagers, um, I think a lot of the problems around things like eating disorders are just repeat, they're just more echoes of the same pattern that when you follow moderate interests, engagement-based ranking pulls you towards extreme interests. And they've seen this over and over again. They can create a new account, they can follow center-left or center-right content, and you'll get pushed to the far left and the far right. And that's another thing that will tear our democracy apart. And so it really is about systemic problems and how do we address these, system like these systemic risks. Thank you. Next speaker is Timo Wolken. Timo, the floor yes. is yours, please. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, for your courage, for standing up for what you believe in and uh, for sharing your knowledge with us here in the European Parliament and answering so many questions. So I'm convinced that your insights can indeed change the course of uh, the negotiations on the Digital Services Act and help making it a true digital constitution for our European citizens. So you made clear how important it is that we tackle social media algorithms. There can be no place in Europe for algorithms that promote disinformation and hate over sober political debate and high quality information for profit reasons. I really believe that. So we need to break the harmful monopoly of big uh, platforms like Facebook over our attention. So in my view, this monopoly rests on two aspects, uh, content recommendation and personalized advertising. So the recommender algorithms are used to keep us on the platform for as long as possible at any cost so that the advertising algorithms can feed us the highly personalized ads to finance the whole operation. So my question would be, uh, and how far are those two sets of algorithms connected, the ones uh, used for recommendation of content and the ones used for advertising? Should we approach them together, or do you think we could solve most issues by focusing on one of the other? The papers, uh, another question on disinformation, so the papers you shared uh, included a striking figure. So, and you mentioned it today, in 2020, Facebook allocated 87% of its budget for de developing its misinformation detection algorithms to the US and only 13% to the rest of the world. This suggests that Facebook prefers to focus on the English-speaking world. What can we in Europe do to force Facebook and others to pay more attention to what is happening here? So do you think we need dedicated legislation to deal with that? Um, yeah, I have, of course, a lot of more questions, but I'll uh, keep it for, for this for now. And thanks again for being here with us and for helping us to make the digital Europe safe. Thank you, Timo. Uh, Ms. Haugen, please. I strongly believe that Europe has a critical role to play in regulating these platforms because you are a vibrant, 
linguistically diverse democracy. Um, there are real problems with having systems that, or having a company that can overlook a language because there are only five million speakers of it. Um, I guarantee you there are European languages, or, or even within larger countries, dialects. And remember, AI is so brittle, it's so fragile. A dialect, I'm guessing UK English, doesn't get anywhere near as much actual efficacy as US English because it's enough different that AI then breaks, right? Um, so I think there's a, a deep, deep need to make sure that platforms must disclose what safety systems they have, what languages those safety systems are in, and the performance per language. And that's the kind of thing where you can put it in the DSA. You can say, you need to be honest with us on, is this actually dangerous for a large fraction of Europeans? Because when you do legislation like that, you actually end up protecting the rest of the world too. Because it will force Facebook towards language neutral, content neutral solutions, um, because that's how what will we'll scale. It also speaks up for people who live in fragile places in the world that don't have as much influence, right? The places in the world that have the most linguistic diversity are often the most fragile um, places, and, and they need Europe to step in because you guys have influence, and you can, help, you can really help them. Um, I, and that includes things like they should publish the content taken down per language. It should be how many staffers are actually protecting German elections or protecting French elections. Um, it should be things like uh, how many staff, like how many moderators are in each language. What's the latency for a review in each language? Because that would be the only way we can have an equitable system. With regard to um, the monopoly being driven by content recommendations or advertising, um, I don't think you will be able to, um, like just having a lot of people to swap in and out recommendation systems, I don't think will be effective because Facebook's, whatever one Facebook controls, because they control the rest of the product changes and they control, have all the data, they will have a much more en enjoyable or addictive experience than anyone else will. And so if you allow people to choose their system, um, also it's a question on business model. It's likely the only way you can make a business that could have its own ranking system is if you cho charged a subscription. As Facebook has shown in places like uh, the lesser developed world, if you charge for other choices and Facebook is free, people overwhelmingly choose Facebook. And so I, I, I think it's really a thing of we need to have accountability and transparency on how Facebook works, then assuming that we can have other choices and the choices are going to be what, what helps us. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to ask Birgit Sippal to take the floor, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks, Mrs. Hogan, for casting the light on the business model of Facebook. And you clearly advocate for accountability, full transparency, and public scrutiny, as we do in the Liebe Committee and in Parliament, and therefore allow me some questions. First of all, you already raised some concerns and criticisms regarding the use of automated tools for content manage manage uh, management and content filters, as they cannot reliably identify illegal content, resulting in suppression of legal content. Do you believe in this context that the addition of human review could be a solution? Second, one of the most important safeguards to all our digital communication, of course, is encryption. And on the one hand, the European Commission announced that it generally does not want to weaken encryption, but again and again we have debates about backdoors. Now, we heard about Facebook's wider plans regarding end-to-end -end encryption. Does it mean that Facebook users can be sure that their privacy is actually protected? And do you believe that the millions of users' communication is safe and confidential now? Um, thirdly, on the DSA, a lot of debates are around the regulation of advertising. And I think uh, the current practices of personalized targeting should be replaced by contextual advertising. And regarding the targeting for commercial advertising, one idea is this should only be possible where users have freely opt in with a limited time to ensure that the once given consent cannot be exploited. What are your views, what Facebook's reactions will be if this 
were legally required. <laughs> and finally, again and again, we have debates about data retention, meaning providers have to collect and store data for years and years. Having in mind Facebook's dominance on the market and regarding all the debates we heard not only today, do you think this is the right approach to give more powers to Facebook and other providers? Thank you. Thank you, but uh, uh, I would like also uh, to ask Maite Pagazaur Tunduach to take the floor, and uh, then we will take also the last question, and, and then I would like to ask uh, Ms. Haugen to respond. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, muy amable. Voy a hablar en español. Aquí, señora Haugen, que le damos las gracias, estamos diputados de cinco comisiones. En mi caso, yo soy de la Comisión Especial de Desinformación. Mañana se va a presentar el proyecto de informe sobre injerencias extranjeras y especialmente sobre la desinformación. La mayoría de las cosas que usted ha indicado hoy y que le han preguntado hoy aparecen en nuestro informe. Le agradecemos muchísimo la corroboración de muchas de nuestros indicios y de nuestras sospechas. Durante más de un año hemos intentado que nos den respuestas sobre la opacidad de los algoritmos, sobre la opacidad en la retirada de contenidos, sobre la, la opacidad en los informes sobre los códigos de buenas prácticas desde 2018. No hemos podido comprobar nada. La opacidad sobre la desinformación y qué se hace al respecto. El director de Política de Seguridad u otros que han venido no nos han dado respuestas. Y desde luego jamás hemos visto a un ingeniero hablándonos de las cosas en Facebook ni en otras tecnológicas. Usted ha indicado en un momento, ha hablado de la adicción del tabaco, por ejemplo. Pero es que es muchísimo peor. Porque nosotros, cada una de las personas que fuma, que no somos todos, en la cajetilla tiene los riesgos. Y hay un montón de impuestos, además, que los estados ponen a las cajetillas porque son elementos tóxicos. Yo, a la hora de venir a, aquí al, a esta sesión, he mirado que llevaba más de seis horas y cincuenta y seis minutos en distintas aplicaciones. Estamos viviendo en Internet. Y usted ha dicho una cosa, y esta es la pregunta que yo le voy a hacer. Cada cambio en el algoritmo tiene que tener un nombre, porque hay una cultura de la irresponsabilidad. Nosotros, los diputados aquí, en este Parlamento, solemos votar nominalmente y dejamos nuestra huella en cada una de las cosas que votamos a favor, en contra o nos abstenemos. Mi pregunta es, ¿podríamos llegar a tener una huella del trabajo, de la realización de los algoritmos? Porque habrá que pensar que en algún momento, en el futuro, posiblemente tengan que responder a querellas. Y cuando uno sabe que no va a ser impune, a lo mejor los códigos internos asamblearios pueden ser más restrictivos con respecto a lo que es tóxico y no es. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. And the last speaker is uh, Iván García del Blanco, please. The last but not the least. Uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, Mrs. Haugen. Uh, I'm going to be speaking Spanish from this moment, so, <laughs> so please uh, take the, the headphones. Um, intentaré no, no repetir uh, las cosas que han ido diciendo mis compañeros durante esta larga comparecencia. Quiero darle las, las gracias otra vez por tomarse tanta paciencia para estar aquí y para agradecerle una vez más uh, que haya dado ese paso en defensa de nuestras libertades y la democracia. Eh, usted es de esas personas que tiene la democracia, que de vez en cuando hacen un gesto de estas características que sobrepasa lo que normalmente hacemos los demás y de esa forma vamos construyendo también civilización. Eh, antes ha hecho usted una referencia a una pregunta de mi colega eh, sobre el metaverso. Eh, a mí sí me preocupa, me preocupa muchísimo porque soy usuario de, del metaverso. Eh, eh, me preocupa el nivel de abstracción que produce, el nivel de eh, desconexión con la realidad, que no tiene parangón, que no tiene ningún tipo de eh, igualdad con otro tipo de experiencia. Me preocupa la cantidad de datos que en la práctica se están eh, aportando constantemente a esa red, que es absolutamente adictiva. Eh, me preocupa también que no sabemos ni siquiera, eh, no tenemos datos fiables ni siquiera del número de 
de, de usuarios. Se estima que en Estados Unidos hay 60 millones, pero, pero no sabemos muchísimo más de eso. Y todo esto teniendo en cuenta que... En esta misma Cámara que estamos intentando regular este tipo de realidades, muy probablemente sepamos qué es eh, Metaverso y qué es Oculus eh, y seamos usuarios cinco, diez diputados. Eh, en fin, eh, me preocupa mucho porque además todo esto está en manos de Mark Zuckerberg, eh, que yo estaría más tranquilo con que estuviera en manos de, de Goldfinger. Pero en cualquier caso... Yo no, no sé, no se me ocurre cómo demonios podemos eh, establecer medidas que puedan regular y establecer eh, cuotas y, y, y regulación dentro de un fenómeno como es el metaverso, que además solo es incipiente en este momento, que se va a desarrollar muchísimo más en el futuro. Y una última cuestión, eh, ya en referencia a algunas de las cuestiones que ha dicho. Además de la DSA y de la DMA, Aquí estamos regulando también la inteligencia artificial. Tenemos una AI Act encima de la mesa que habla de los algoritmos. Eh, y hay una cuestión referida concretamente a los algoritmos que pueden afectar subliminalmente, sobre todo a menores. Eh, yo no sé si eh, dentro de esta jerarquización que establece eh, como propuesta esta AI, AI, AI Act eh, está de acuerdo con que los algoritmos que moderan esta clase de contenidos deben ser materia también de, eh, de, de, de una regulación específica como material de alto riesgo, eh, como uno de los algoritmos que pueden afectar a estas cuestiones de alto riesgo. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask uh, Ms. Hogan to take the floor. How much time do I have? Do I only get two minutes now for those three? Sorry, it's, time it's, is it's, over. It's okay. but, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, do English, I'll do it as fast yes. as I can. I'll do it as fast as I can. Um, okay. Um, okay, so with regard to human review, because two of you asked about it, um, I, human, part of why fa Facebook doesn't do enough human review is human review does not scale. When they talk about having 40,000 moderators, they have 3.1 billion uh, users. Like, it's just not possible to have humans review enough of the content. Um, that's why I advocate for making these systems s more human scale, less opportunities for mass distribution to a million people, and um, uh, finding more ways that humans moderate each other um, versus having AI do it. With regard to encryption, um, I'm really concerned that Facebook should publish what is it doing in terms to implement uh, encryption, because when you give people a false sense of safety, they can actually put themselves at jeopardy. And so forcing Facebook to disclose, like, what are the safety systems, how do they work? Because we saw with a whistleblower prior to my, my, my SEC filing, which is a week before, that they felt that Facebook had not adequately communicated how safety systems worked on WhatsApp and that people would be separate. So I think having that level of transparency is really essential. Um, with regard to, uh, in, let's see, I do worry about this concept of addiction or things that are, are drawing people in. Um, there were two comments around the hours and hours that people spend on these platforms. I think ha this is true across all platforms. I think you should have to disclose by percentile. And, and not just by percentile for extreme users, so this is the top 1%, maybe by tenth of a percentile, how many hours do people spend on these systems per week? Because the real problem on a lot of these things for the harms involved is that as people get exposed to targeted misinfo or the misinfo of these concentrated communities, they get cut off from the rest of reality. Right, that when you begin to believe beliefs that are not consent, consent, like beliefs that are the consensus norms, it makes it harder for you to reintegrate into society, and you pull people into these these rabbit holes. Um, so I think disclosing how much time people are spending is going to be important, especially for the metaverse. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the novel Snow Crash, which is where the phrase the metaverse came from, specifically talked about in that book. I'm, I'm shocked they picked this name. In that book, the, meta the metaverse is a dystopian thing, that people's lives are so unpleasant that they need to hide in the system for half of their, half of their day. I think that's what's going to happen. You're going to have people who are disconnected from society or marginalized, and you're going to have people getting pulled into these virtual worlds because they are really addictive. They are really compelling. They give people a sense of agency when they might not have it in their real lives. 
And I think requiring uh, publishing or, or having people disclose, like, do they feel like they're in, they're in control? We have to have ways of getting uh, research and governance on these things. With regard to um, uh, the quantity of data delivered, in the case of the metaverse, I'm very concerned about that. We talked about before that these systems require having even more sensors in our life. And the issue I'm even more concerned about is if they're trying to aim for the workplace, people don't get to consent in their workplaces in the same way. And so I worry about the idea of Facebook forming profiles on us where people can't even opt out because it's between their livelihood and uh, their privacy. Um, I highly encourage this idea on um, for, for opting in on personalized targeting. There should be time limits because people should be able to make different choices over time. And I strongly encourage having that be time bounded. And I think the last one I'm going to comment on uh, data retention. So something that Facebook definitely takes advantage of is they no longer retain data beyond 90 days. Um, that actually has some pretty serious security implications. So uh, a thing that we found across when I was working with the threat investigators was that often it was hard to see how um, things like influence networks evolved or the impact of terrorism recruiting because we could only see back 90 days. But the only way you got to have data over time was if you, uh, you intentionally flagged that person. And so it became difficult to actually track the evolution of some of these systems. Um, and so I think there are, uh, there should be questions around how data retention works. I'm not saying keep it for years, but maybe more than 90 days would be helpful. Maybe six, maybe six months or something. But yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for your time. I'm incredibly grateful that the European Union is taking this seriously. I think you guys are really a light in the darkness. Like, I feel confident that you guys are going to pass a law that has teeth, that it has dynamic ways of adjusting over time. Um, because we need that. We are going to need oversight on these platforms more and more with time. They have far too much power in our society to be able to operate in the dark. And Facebook has shown they will not give us any data unless we force them to. The last thing I want to drop, drop in there before my six minutes expires is Facebook has shown that they will lie with data. And so I encourage you to put in the DSA, if Facebook gives you data, they should have to show you how they got it because we have had multiple scandals where Facebook says they've given out data, but because every data analysis requires assumptions, Facebook makes assumptions and then doesn't disclose them. So we think we know what data we're looking at, but in reality, they are misleading us. They have the best data scientists in the world. They can dance with data unlike anyone else. And it's really, really important that they should have to disclose the process, the queries, the notebooks they use to pull this data, because you can't trust anything they give you unless you can confirm them. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, here uh, this uh, evening. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the members of the Parliament and our guests uh, taking part in this hearing. Uh, this fundamental piece of legislation on what uh, our digital economy is based in the European Union is e-commerce directive. All those main principles, country of origin principle, limited liability principle, uh, uh, prohibition of uh, general, mo general monitoring are coming from uh, e-commerce directive. But we got to this e-commerce uh, directive already 20 years ago. At that time, we didn't have the social uh, media platforms, we didn't have the sharing economy uh, platform, uh, platforms. And it's absolutely clear, we have to update uh, this e-commerce directive and our Digital Services Act is de dealing exactly uh, with those issues. So I'm absolutely sure that uh, all our members of the parliament, uh, they've got a lot of uh, pros and contras and uh, now uh, they are uh, more confident in, in their decisions uh, than before this hearing. Once again, thank you very much for being here with, with us today. Next meeting will take place on the 1st of December this year. Thank you.